Three sides of the coin this week. Jim Rota, Fireball Ministry, huge Kiss fan, Wasp, Vinnie Vincent. So much cool, intelligent conversation. Great conversation. This is Three Sides of the Coin, talking all things Kiss. I want to rock and roll all night. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. I know Lisa. Just the three Weisenheimers, Michael, Tommy, and Mark. Mm-hmm. Um, before we get into this week's so immensely cool guest, Tommy, any comments you want to read? Anything you want to share? No. Thanks I was for doing your job once again. Well, no, because it's uh, 823 Mark's time. He's going to be joining Izzy. He hasn't eaten yet. He's hangry. And so I'm like, okay, I guess we're not doing any. Thing. So once so again, the show work. revolves around Mark. Yeah. Mark. But there was a guy who said he'd give his his uh, stimulus check to Lisa just to watch her for an hour oh. or something like that. There's some crazy comments on this week's show. So I, 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 I don't have the comment in front of me, but there was somebody who was like, did Lisa say she's 50 years old? My God, she looks like she's 30. Yeah, yeah she'll love that. You're right. She looks yeah. incredible. She, mm-hmm. She's beautiful. Um, all right, so uh, no housekeeping because we got to get rid of Mark. Let's get right yep. into our guest. Uh, we have you got to stick through this one because that initially you might go, What's the connection here? We've got Jim Rhoda from Fireball Ministry, he's also close to Dave Grohl. He produced um, Sonic Highways. Uh, what was the other documentary, Tommy? Um, uh, um, a sound station. Sound, sound, sound yeah. So, yeah. Sound uh-huh. city. Sound city. Sound city. Sorry. Yep. Sound city. Um, it's amazing. It, it's all about that studio. particular uh, studio that so many uh, bands and artists uh, recorded in. Yep. Yep. And it, Jim's just a huge, I mean, serious Kiss fan here. He knows yeah, like right out of the box. Right El- out of the to- box. Oh, and 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 if that's not enough. We give you a mini wasp podcast right in the middle of this. Jim and Mark yeah. take off and talk wasp. It's just yeah. a couple minutes. Yeah. But, uh, look, a lot of the fans out there realize the Blackie's brilliance, and I think they'll appreciate it. And we didn't go on for too long about that. But uh, fortunately, Jim is is brilliant musically, unlike these two freaking dolts I have to see every week. And <laughs> Look, we got to talk a little wasp. So and we find out what Jim thinks of Vinnie Vincent. Unfortunately, again. <laughs> um, all right, let this roll. Trust me when I say we loved this interview. It was phenomenal. Let it roll, Jim Rota, Fireball Ministry. Want to get your official three sides of the coin logo and shocker tee? Now you can. We ship worldwide. Get yours online at shop.threesidesofthecoin.com. Hey, Three Sides listeners. So we are super excited to be joined by Jim Rhoda. Founder, are you a founder or are you one of the founders? Of the band? Of the band. Uh, it was uh, Emily and I first. All right, so a co-founder of Fireball Ministry. That, Thanks, see, guys. See, see, look at how much show prep I do. I don't even know if you founded or co-founded the band. Yeah, no, I know. I mean, yeah, look, it, in bands, who knows how any of that stuff ever you know comes together. It's like you don't know. That's a good – it's, you know, like plus people lie. It's the, the yeah, it's, just, it's the Make stuff it more of lore. interesting than it was, you know. Exactly. Like... So, so, you know, so everyone's going to be going, why is Jim on the show? Because Jim is a huge Kiss fan. True story. Jim has been begging us for 10 years to come on the show. He's not Put telling a lie. He's going to defend something that's indefensible, but we're going to let him later on anyway. And then that, I have, a, I have a feel- I bet you it'll be a, it'll be a few things. <laughs> I, I have a feeling Jim is also going to express his admiration for something that at least two thirds of the three sides crew here are going to go. Oh no, that's it. We're done. 
This is going to be an interesting discussion. I can just feel it already. Well, my my feeling is like you know, in the world, in the world that we live in right now, where you know people people should be listening to each other more. Let's just let's, no. They should let's be listening to three. Somewhere. They should be listening to three sides more. You've got nothing else to do. <laughs> That's exactly. Uh, I'm looking something up for my uh, defense here. I apologize if I'm looking down. I should have prepared. Oh, there's no preparation no, you know, on this show. Part of the, the charm of the show. Nothing's prepared. Nothing's prepared. We aren't ready, Never. and and it pisses people off, and we don't give a crap. Have no, you guys? We... All right. So, have you guys read the that that book? I can't remember the name. You guys will probably know it in a second. But the uh, the one that that guy wrote about the elder, the one where he yeah. Went... oh yeah, Ju- yeah Ju- Ju- Julian really Gill's book, book, Odyssey. It, really good. Great. Book. Now what do you, what do you now what what do you say about that? Like, tell me what your takeaway was from that. What, just the book in general? You did yeah. a great job. Yeah, yeah, it's a really cool book. Yeah. yeah. But you hate that record. Well, Mark does. Well, I don't. Oh, okay. it, it, it's not so much as you, again, because you've, uh, you've said you've watched the show for a while and everything. At one of my things in life that, it's put it this way, it's not only true in Kiss, it's true with everything. Timeline is everything. Yes. If you started, if you became a Kiss fan in 1996, regardless of age, and went back to the catalog, you're going to see the elder differently yes. than I did. Because I saw it in real time. Yeah, me too. Plus, well, but hold on. Yeah. Plus, being 16 in 1981, when all the contemporary bands, you know, Van Halen, New Ozzy, you know, and then this band who just a couple years ago, studio-wise, the side four of Alive 2 and Love Gun and, you know, this hard rocking band that you love, they were starting to, you know... Oh, yeah. You know, Dynasty was all right. And again, I'm looking at this through a 15- and 16-year-old's eyes, and which is different when you fi- find the band in 1996 or whatever. Mm-hmm. You're going to have a totally different appreciation. I've told, as a matter of fact, I even told the story I think last week on it. But when I first p- dropped the needle on 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 uh, on the elder, I was like, "Cool, they're back. They're playing heavy metal, hard rock." Yeah. And by the time the end of the record was over, it certainly wasn't that. So I, it it was a huge disappointment because it, a my the the band's contemporaries, and that's so important in timeline. Mm-hmm. The contemporaries to Kiss were eating their fucking lunch, is what they were doing, which is why, regardless of the the the, 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 the and, and trust me, this is one of those things I, I did want to touch on today, uh, you know, internet Kiss stuff because when I do read, and it's not that they're wrong because it's art, art is subject, you know, sure. Kiss, but when I see people go, the Elders, their best record, or that's, that's the ridiculous. ultimate Kiss record. Mm-hmm. I'm like, you're saying that, I think, partially out of you're trying to outfan the next guy. Because if you're honest with yourself, <laughs> that's, well, no, as, as their that. best yeah. record, no, it may be your favorite. You can say that, I guess. But they didn't gain tons of fans because of the elder. People didn't get into Kiss in general. Because you have to say that on a podcast because... You know, everyone wants to be the again the unique person. Of, oh no, that's no, it's not. No, they couldn't fuck it. They couldn't even tour under the goddamn album. So don't tell me that's that's their fucking peak and that's where they're the yeah, greatest. Yeah. They look the best and they sounded the best. No, they didn't. They didn't fucking know where they were. They weren't <laughs> even making the same record. Correct. Correct. Yeah, yeah. So again, you you want to have that niche opinion that that you're such a great fan that only you can see the brilliant today. Yeah, I'm fucking fine with that. Go ahead. But don't try and tell the masses that yeah. that is the best Kiss album. That's their best look. That was the ultimate Kiss experience. <laughs> no, it wasn't. They couldn't fucking draw flies don't, don't, for a reason. Don't That's tell, don't tell people Earth. who were there as it happened because that is so critical to, to not just the elder, but to any object in history that you want to have a discussion and a debate about is having as mark said so eloquently having the opinion now looking back is completely different than the four of us 
who were there as it happened. Now, you know, my take on the elder was a bit different than Mark's. I wasn't as as disappointed as he was, but coming from from Love Gun into basically Dynasty, then into Unmasked, then into the Elder, living that period, you were like really, really tested yes. as a fan. You your but. devotion was really tested, and and you know, and, and keep in mind, Kiss was not everywhere. It's not the era of the internet, so you couldn't just pull up the yeah. internet and see what was going on and see this video and look at these photos. All of a sudden, Kiss was basically disappearing from everything by 1981. Other than other than the pictures that was show that were showing up in Super Teen and 16, mm-hmm. but even that, as a rock fan, you're like, yeah, but he's right next to the Bee Gees and Leif Garrett, and that's not really cool. I love it that there there's photos that I could see. But why am I not seeing cool stuff in rock magazines? Well, it, the machine, it's, I love that record more, more for the study of, of what it looks like when four people that are supposed to be a, a, a solid unit together can't even get on the same page for one song. And it's like a great thing to look at to see how, you know, I don't know. It just feels so epically misguided that there's a beauty in it. Does that make any sense? It, it, to- it totally yeah. makes sense because, it, you know, I've, I've given lots of, of presentations and keynotes at marketing events. And I always try and incorporate KISS into it. And one of the things I always talk about is how you've got to follow your passion. Don't follow other people's passion. Don't Ever. let other people come in and tell you this is right, this is wrong, do this, you'll get greater results, blah, blah, blah. It's something that we, we follow every week on this podcast. We don't care what our listeners think. We do what we love. And that's actually pretty tough. Now, we're not a band, but in the littlest sense, we are we, we experience some of that because we have listeners who are fans who try and say, you can do this is what you want. This is what you need to do. This is what I love. This is what will be successful. And I tell people, and I've said this in speeches, it's like, if you follow the advice of others, you end up recording what will become your elder, which yeah. was clearly not talking about the music. Because again, the music is debatable and it's, you know, it's a personal opinion. But that was an effort. Even the band admitted back then, they recorded that not for themselves. They recorded that to try and impress critics and label people and everybody else around them. And it was an utter failure to their fans who go, this isn't Kiss. This isn't what I want. This isn't what I like. So, you know, that a study into that is really beneficial for the elder. I think, you know, I think every, every recording artist out there Let's be honest. I'm sure every major band that's been around 40 to 50 years has an <laughs> elder in their catalog. At least one. At least well, one. So study that. that. Study how how did that come about? Why did it come about? What did the re- end results look like? And how did they recover from it? But And the other piece, too, is when you talk to people that I would consider to be marginal KISS fans or people who don't like the band at all, a lot of them say, well, The Elder's kind of the one record I thought they did pretty good on. Yeah, because... That's interesting, yeah, too. I love that. I love them because they are... You know, the original lineup of that band is quint- the quintessential di- band dynamic from the outside yeah. and also from the inside. Like, there's always one member of the band who's got to be have some kind of business sense and we all know who that is in the band then there's got to be one member of the band that is you know universally appealing and we all know who that is and then there's got to be a member of the band that is 
unquestionably cool by anyone's standards. And we know who that is. And I'm going to let you know who my feelings are of those people because I'm saying you know who that is. And then there's you know one member of the band that kind of doesn't matter. It's fine. It's <laughs> and we know who that is. <laughs> right. See? It's like so weird. But that's like every band has to have that. Like to me, I'm always looking in every band I see and I'm like, who's the Gene? Who's the Paul? Who's the Peter? And who's the Ace? Yep. Yep. Every band I listen to. I could tell you, I could tell you who that is in my band. I could tell you who that is. It, you know, in bands who I work with a lot or whoever, you know, or I'm friends with. It's just funny. I do have to, I'm going to tell you one other elder thing and then we have to talk about it anymore if you guys don't want no, to. We, no, I tell you what, see, that's the one thing that people dismiss when we start talking. I find the elder just as fascinating as you do. Yeah. yeah. I Look, it's, I have a different appreciation for the elder than the types of fans who say it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. Yes. My own, again, not to beat a dead horse, but the, you know, what I said earlier is that's the part that perplexes me. That's the beauty behind being a kiss fan is this. Yeah. The line doesn't do this. No. You know, the line is like this. There's mm-hmm. peaks and valleys. Um, I find the elder fucking fascinating. So, I, I think, so, I think that, you know, especially, and that's one of the cool things about being a KISS collector, like, demo-wise and stuff. They had the goods to come up with a good record right about that time. Oh, yeah. But, but they didn't, you know. They they bought into to Ezrin's, you know, because keep in mind, and, and the backstory behind the Elder is incredible. Yeah. But it was really Ezrin that talked them, which you guys and a lot of the fans here know. But but without Ezrin's insistence and to follow this and look, I love Gene and I, you know, but that story is something that a fucking 10 year old would come up with. There was nothing compelling about that story at all. No, and, and like, you, yeah, you got to have somebody who knows how to write a story, write a story. Correct, correct. I think Gene's, that was so paint by numbers, it wasn't even funny. I mean, it was like a bad episode of HR Puffin stuff, if you think about <laughs> it. You know, <laughs> instead of the boy, you have Jimmy, you know, and you have Witchy Poo instead of fucking uh, Mr. Blackwell. I mean, it's, it's, there's fucking nothing to it. And, and to have someone like, Bob Ez- Ezrin go, hey, you know, that's you're on to something there, my man. We're gonna we're gonna build this rock opera, and and that's another thing too, guys. That music on there is not that complex. Yeah. I mean, if you want to compare it to the Wall or something, no, it's not. It's there, there's not. It's not even in the same fucking category as something mm-hmm. like Hemispheres, you know, by yeah. rock. No, I'm just talking about in total scope. And 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 musical, and again, guys, it's Kiss. A Kiss to me, Kiss should be fun, loud, yes. fun. That's what Kiss is about, and that's why they're so popular in the long run. I agree, but but the Elder is very fascinating to sit and you know go over and talk to other fans about. I mean, it's certainly more interesting than say my favorite my favorite studio record is Rock and Roll Over. Me For too. as much as that's my favorite studio record by Kiss, it's nowhere near as interesting as The Elder. <laughs> There's not as so, much we can talk about and debate yeah, about yeah, that every one. Every song's great, move on, next record. You know, not, you know, The the Elder is a Kiss fan. Jesus Christ, you could sit and for days and contemplate that thing and the, and it's so polarizing like even with i mean among fans it's interesting what you said about you know uh, the thing that when you were just talking about uh you know living the timeline thing i uh, we always call that time place and circumstance right that's what that's what kind of sh- shapes and defines what your opinion is you know when you're growing up it's, and i have a good friend who's a record producer a successful one and you know, he, I don't know, he's one of those guys that, you know, he's older than me, 10 years older than me. And he, he'll do the same thing, but call bullshit on Bond or on uh, Brian Johnson. You know, he'll do the same thing, you know, cause he was there when that happened. And he was an ACDC fan when Bon Scott 
was the singer. And then Spawn died, and they, it's like the Van Halen and Sammy Hagar thing. Like, there's some people that'll just be like, I can't accept this. Yeah. Yeah, I, I get all that, but you know, that's that's. I think I I don't think those are fair examples, though. Um, you know, the elder the 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 other two bands, like when you when you said Sammy and and Dave, and then you know, um, Bon and and Brian, those circumstances are totally different than the Kiss circumstance. And again, oh, this yeah. is what makes the elder so fascinating. Gene and Paul wanted, which I think started. On Dynasty, actually, um, they suddenly wanted to be taken a little bit more serious. Yep. I think that was also the case on on, on Unmasked. I, I thought they want they wanted to like write pop music, and at the time, look at look what was going on in 1980. Mm-hmm. I mean, that super sheen sort of poppy sound, and I honestly think they thought that you know it was going to be an easy transition to some degree. Yeah. I, I guess I can't say they thought that for sure, but. I think that's what the general. Well, you Mar- know, Mark, you, 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 you. That's that's a fair statement, especially when you look at "I Was Made for Loving You," the previous album. I mean, Paul comes right out and says, "I wanted to see if I could write a disco song," and I did. And all of a sudden, it's a huge hit for them. You can't tell me he's not going. Wow, I can do that again. That was easy. I'm just yeah. going to write up. I'm going to. Our next album is going to be nothing but "I Was Made for Loving You" songs. Yeah. And, and by then, again, that's, that goes back to what I said. You know, they elim- they they alienated their the fans who, uh, again, compare Dynasty to Side Four of Alive too, because they're only basically a year and a half apart. It's crazy. That sounds like two different bands, you yeah. know. And in some ways, it was. Uh, you know, the mindset was certainly different. You know, the producer was certainly different. The the culture of the music changed. At times, the guitar player was different. Yeah. That's another thing young fans need to understand. The cl- hard rock was on its way down mm-hmm. around late 70s, early 80s. It, what, matter of fact, Cream did an expose on his Heavy Metal Dead, if you remember that that cover story that Cream Magazine did. It, was, it wasn't doing what it was doing earlier, and... And in 1980, the floodgates opened again. So the music was going a bit down, and then it, it, it took off again. Man, with the new wave that can, heavy metal. Only you, that can happen. You, you know, I mean, what's interesting with The Elder is, again, if you go back to 80, 81, when that was happening, nobody would have discounted, oh, my God, you want, you can get Bob Ezrin to produce the next Kiss album? You know, right for, for, first of all, he 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 did wonders with Destroyer, which brought the band to a whole nother level. Then he did the Wall, which in itself is just a whole nother level of an album for anybody who did an album back then. I mean, the Wall yeah. was it's it. still it still is. But again, if you were back then, the Wall was it. Everybody was talking but, the Wall. Total, and they but the guys in Pink Floyd. Like at that, like they weren't trying to prove that they were right. Legi- a legitimate it's who they band. were, kid, yeah. kid, you know. So, so obviously, you know, when 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 the band and Bill Coin go to the label and say, "Oh yeah, we got Bob Ezrin coming in to produce," yeah. oh, and he's going to do a concept album. And early on, the talk was it's going to be a hard rock album. We're getting back to our roots. Nobody's going to question that. It it's got. All of the right ingredients are being put in there, mm-hmm. but at the end of the day, they got mixed in the wrong quantities, and it tastes like a pile of shit. They didn't have a script, you know? <laughs> yeah, the movie, there you go. The movies, they didn't have a script. Yep. And that's the first thing you need. Everybody needs to know what's well, going to happen. Also, also, too, the chemistry. Ace was in no okay. shape, and both Gene and Paul, although not substance-wise— Ego-wise, we're in two different... I mean, it was such a fractured ship to begin with. It, it wasn't even funny. So, I mean... They were so you know, surrounded by yes-men by that point in time that 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 nobody had the balls to say, this isn't going to be good, except for Ace. Ace is the yeah. one that stood up and said, this is not right. I don't want to be part of this. This isn't what KISS is about. Everybody well, else in the KISS really world was of- saying yes. Didn't Ezrin kind of chastise him for it too at the time? 
I don't recall that. Ace? I, I don't know. I, th- I just could have sworn I'd read about how he was butting heads with him constantly about that. It wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, me either. I mean, Ace, you know, although he, you know, if I had to pick a favorite, you know, Ace is probably my con- my consistent favorite since I was a kid. But I also am not crazy enough to realize that that was probably a difficult personality to be in a band with. Yeah. To begin with. And then on top of it, you have, you know, the habits. And then on top of that, you have his dynamic with, you know, basically a double alpha male team. He, he, lo- he lost his ally in Peter. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. There, there was so much that with hindsight here, we can look back and go, oh, yeah, that was a contributing factor. That was wrong. Bad, 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 bad. But as you're sitting in it right then, a lot of people are going, wow, this can't go wrong. You've got everything. You've got Kiss, one of the biggest bands in the world. you got Bob Ezrin coming off of off of the, the wall, um, you know. Yeah, we got a new drummer, but this new drummer is really a monster in in Mm -hmm. Aaron Carr. But too much internal issues and too much ego and too much yes men. And, you know, again, it goes back to what you first said, Jim. It's a great study. I mean, Mm -hmm. even if you absolutely hate and detest Kiss, study that so you don't recreate that same problem with your own band. Oh, there's a million, like, you know, just in KISS, there's a million studies. You know, as as fans, you realize, like, you know, how to build hysteria, you know, from the ground up. Like, where the Beatles started, you know, they, hysteria happened. But I always feel like KISS figured out how to, to, to create it. the same hysteria, but, like, actually engineer it, yep. you know. You know, just stay on that. Stay on that bit about the other, just because I do find it so fascinating. Yeah, no, I'm in. no, no. They knew going into the elder that their star was basically about out in yeah. in, in the United States. It was. They knew that. There's a reason they didn't tour the L or the, the unmasked. unmasked. That didn't happen, uh, guys. If you, if you're Kiss and you're and you're a coin back then, mm-hmm. if if, and I'm just throwing the song title out. If Shandy was top five, yeah, you don't think they would have said "fuck Europe"? We're 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 playing all we're two, over. We're the two United in the U.S. States. Yep. Oh, guy. Again, this does not get brought up enough. The fact that they knew their goose was cooked, and and that's why they did what they did. They already sat, and the way they were looking at it was, oh, we saturated the market. You know, Mm -hmm. all all this bullshit instead of, oh, our latest record barely went gold. Yeah. We just come off a string of platinum records. We barely, barely went gold with the new one. That's the reality, not that it's oversaturated. Your your records were selling. You you, 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 you did oversaturate, but all this is on you, not the record buying public. Yeah, but no one's, I mean, and at that point, management's gonna, you know, management's never gonna walk in and tell you you're doing anything wrong. You know, they're never, no one was walking into that office. Well, a good manager would. That's what, hold on, I'll give you a great example. When Doc McGee, years later, told Paul, Mike, you know this story well, you stink! Towards the end of the original uh, farewell yep. tour, couldn't go anymore. That's that's a manager doing his job. Yeah, I agree. That's the difference. But it takes a lot to get to that point, you know. And especially if you've had all that those years of success with that artist, it's like, you know, you're you're just trying to maintain, you know, maintain. Like it's all so volatile anyway, especially when you have four pretty distinctively different personalities in any band like it's 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 a weird it's always a weird dynamic like no one ever feels you know listen anyone that wants to strap on a guitar get on a stage and jump around like an idiot you know uh you know you um yeah there's already a lot of shit wrong with you that you're probably not dealing with so you know that's why it makes it easy for musicians to be addicts because (laughs) That's usually like the thing that's available to you at all times from right. other people. 
and it, and it helps you, you know, it helps you get over the weird shit. And then, you know, Gene and Paul were lucky because they, you know, they could they could control themselves, but not everybody's that way. That's tough. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if Gene and Paul had addictions, no. like Ace and Peter? They well, the, ba- the, the 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 band first of all I don't think ever would have made it past the elder era. It would no. have it would have go- disappeared. No, I mean that's you just basically described the New York Dolls. You know, it's like yeah, the New York Dolls could have been amazing, but nobody, not one of those. There was no Gene or Paul in that band. Not not one one person anchoring them to the to the that's universe. A, that, that's a great study in itself because I. I like I like the New York Dolls. I, I if I whenever I say like I love a band, that means I have like tons of bootlegs and stuff. I I, I mean I've got the first couple Dolls records. I I love. I it's funny because when Tommy and I when we were with Bryn, we were talking about um, that album. I've always said that they that was a, a the wrong producer, Rundgren weakened those songs. They needed someone like Eddie Kramer who would have mm-hmm. brought the guitars up tightened up and that was another thing you know that the rhythm section needed to be tightened up look i get that they have that scrappy yeah, yeah. sort of i get that but it if you listen i'll give you a great example probably the kings of scrappy liveness are the rolling stones but when you and you're pop 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 when they're i mean under my that's tight yeah. baby that's snappy yeah. that yeah. Live maybe not so much, but on the record, and that's the whole thing with with the dolls. They they needed a producer to go in there and go. You need you need to tighten this up. Rain it in. Yes, yes. That's that's the whole thing. So you can you can be both, but at at one point you're you. Anyways, that 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 record would have done better with a better producer, and that band would have done better had they had disciplined management. Because I some of those songs are there. Some oh, hundred percent. Uh, personality crisis should still. It's never been on FM radio, at least you know, like an Aerosmith. Right. Song. Yeah. But if, but, it a, been. but if the band members are a mess, it doesn't matter who the manager is. You know, you can't pull it back together. Not that bad. Yeah. No, definitely not. I mean, I think that whole. Yeah. Well, first of all, that you reminded me of something. I. I. Uh, I produced this movie called Sound City a few years ago. It's a documentary on yeah, it. Brilliant. It. Brilliant. Love, yeah, cool. love it, love it, love so it. That, you know, that's my day job. And um, so it, Keith Olsen, who did, um, you know, a bunch of the, you know, he did the huge White Snake record, you know, like the 70 or 87 White Snake record, a whole bunch of records in the 80s. I don't know if you remember the part in, this, in, the, in that movie where he explains what a record producer does. And it's it was this awesome moment where he was like, you know, I forget, you know, not not verbatim here, but where he says, like, it's you're the conduit between the artists and getting it onto tape in a way that is pleasing to everybody. And that's that's what the New York Dolls didn't have. Like they they didn't have like you said, they didn't like nobody was turning screws or making the edges match and shit. And that's important, you know. I mean, there's plenty of bands that are huge and influential that haven't done that, but you know, I, you know, you honestly, we could say the same thing about the first Kiss record. Oh yeah, be, be, because for as much as I love that record, and again, you could say the same, you know, the Dolls. I love it's not that I don't love that record. It's, it's a good record. It's a good. Yeah. Record. But the first Kiss record isn't seen like the first Montrose record or the first Zeppelin record or the, you know, it or the first bad company record. It just didn't come out and boom. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? It, it hit you uh, not only performance wise, but sound wise, you know? Yeah. And, and that's one of the reasons too, I threw in the Montrose one is because that wasn't a big record, but over time it's the production on it. And, oh, yeah. and the performances are really legendary now. Whereas in the kiss record, everyone still says the same thing. All oh, the songs are really good, but it wasn't produced all that well. So time hasn't changed that. Yeah. Whereas again, those three records I just mentioned both over time and in, and on immediate impact, they had, they had that, they had the it factor already because I couldn't make a strong argument again, that strutter should have been like, 
walk this way or something. Yeah, at least, that, at least that, on the radio. Yeah, yeah correct. Yeah. It had the ingredients. It's a good, catchy, hard rock song. What was missing? The production. It's kind of thin. And I think that's why people really gravitated to Kiss Alive. Mm-hmm. Hey, that sounds better there. Exciting. Well, it sounds better because yeah. it's got a better producer and, you know, they... They learned a thing or two along the way. What what do they always say about that? They're like, well, people keep saying we don't sound in concert like we do on our records. Well, they changed that, and mm-hmm. next thing you know, they had a platinum album on their wall, you know? Well, and I love those songs, but I got to tell you, they're so much better to me on a live. Yeah, I agree. All the way around. There, 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 there's definitely something to be said for a a skilled experienced producer working with a band you know those first three kiss records yeah they had producers but i think you know everybody could make the argument they're not exactly what you would call skilled experienced top-notch producers on those first three albums when you get to destroyer when you get to rock and roll over when you get to love gun you can all of a sudden sonically just hear and feel just that little bit extra of difference that a producer brings to an album. You know, I, I was just in a in a discussion last week with fans who were talking about Monster and Sonic Boom, and I was just like, those are perfect albums for me, because I know Mark loves the albums. Mm-hmm. And for me, I'm like, they are an illustration of a band that needed a real producer. Paul Stanley was not a producer. He was too close to the whole thing. That's the difference between listening, in my opinion, to Revenge and listening to Monster is Bob Ezrin going, "Mm, just a little bit more, just tweak that chorus, redo this, and all of a sudden you're like, wow, that sounds brilliant. Revenge is the reason why you should love Vinnie Vincent. I I guess well, I'm with you. Well, well, now, now we are done. Writing <laughs> skills are off the charts. Uh, I, I think he's he, an incredible writer. It's, it's for me. The argument has always been: it's what he did to the band in changing the sound, and it's not his fault that he just is who he is. Yeah, but it wouldn't have been my choice for creatures. I, I hear you. Vin, I, Vin, yeah, I was just, gonna, I was going to say, you know, we've all Tommy and I. That's all we said. Listen, Vinny is a, an incredible songwriter. There is absolutely no denying his songwriting ability. I I can tolerate, I can I can deal with Vinny when he was in Kiss on Creatures and Lick It Up because he was we was heavily restrained by Gene and Paul. But once those restraints were taken off and he went solo and you saw his you saw Vinny's real <laughs> personality playing well, whatever well, i was just like holy crap. crap that's one thing well I, we got to go back i never i don't like his solos i i'm on this show saying i'm not a fan of his solo stuff i only if you're going to use that as an example then i'm with you and tommy i i love what he brought to kiss i like him within the confines of kiss i i'm not a fan of his solo solo work i've never said that i i his songwriting i do wish he would have played all the solos on creatures for continuity's sake and i'll give you a great example to this day tommy thayer is playing mostly the vinnie vincent inspired solo on the song creatures of the night yes the bends in the in the pre-chorus before the that's vinnie and vinnie brought that to the live version thank you baby oh. Rick, let's just run me by so um you know that it didn't sound like that naturally. I think it was it Steve Ferris. I think played that on the, on the record. It's not that it's a bad solo, but Vinny's playing the way Vinny's interpretation is way better in my yeah, opinion. I mean, he knows how to write songs for them. Because look at Unholy. It's like yeah, exactly. He just knows how to like he he can walk in a room with those guys and just be like, oh, you need a Kiss song. <laughs> you need a that's... Gene Simmons demonic right. song. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, but it's it... it's just that's that's a pretty like, and they called him. You know, like even after he was such a pain. You know, you know, like self like admitted by the band, like how difficult he was. You know, they still called for 
They still call them again for songs. That's what's so crazy. Well, because... Hold on a second. That's 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 true partially. Gene was letting him back in to the fold because he was in bad financial shape. Oh, and wow. this could also help Gene out too. Yeah. I don't think – here's my point in all that. I don't think had, – had Vinny's career gone well yeah. or even – self-sustaining doesn't have to be well self-sustaining i don't think gene makes that phone call in the early 90s i just think they they do no do the next record and move on right i I agree but but with Vinny reaching out going look i'm not going to be a knucklehead anymore and do you have any work for me because i tell you what as a contractor i do the same things i call people that i i've worked for in the past just when times get slow and go do you have anything for me that's just what that's just hustle. what people do. That's and I think that's what, yeah. that's what Vinny did. He was reaching out, and Gene said, hey, you know what? Look, you are a knucklehead. We have some. We had some differences, but you do have talent. You yes. are a songwriter. And you're absolutely right. The stuff you put – look, I want to be honest. You can tell the stuff he wrote on Revenge. It's way better. Yeah, it's weird. Yes. It's totally that's weird. That's the why the, that record is so good. It's his songwriting capabilities. I'm gonna listen to that record when we're done today. And you know, it it you know if you when you, when you bring in a combination of a great producer and a great songwriter, you know you can you can do wonderful things. I mean, let's go back to our our first interview we had with Michael James Jackson, where he said, "I'm producing creatures," and I knew these guys, Gene and Paul, didn't have the songs. They yeah. didn't have the songs. I was calling everybody I knew in L.A. to see if they wanted to co-write, if they had any material. And he found, I mean, listen, there's no denying the songs on Creatures are incredible. Brian Adams. Yeah, like so many. I mean, Brian Adams writes great fucking songs, like period. Like that, you know, whether they're for Brian Adams or someone else or Kiss, like the guy's a good songwriter. And there's a video I, I out right now that I just saw of him playing War Machine on the acoustic guitar. I saw that. Guitar. I saw that backstage at one of his concerts. It was great. Is he singing it? Oh, yeah, I gotta watch. just a little I gotta bit, watch. like a, you know, forty-five second clip. Yeah, I think I think somewhere in it he then like he's playing. He's like, and I wrote this song, and I can't remember the lyrics. <laughs> yeah. By the way, Eric said that John's a great guy. See. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, him and we we toured with Alice Cooper, our band, years ago. And uh, a funny Eric story. This is why I, I've always liked Eric. Two reasons. Um, we toured with Alice Cooper, and he Eric was the drummer in the band at the time. It was like right when he was kind of transitioning into Kiss full time. So John had this 1980... Uh, Ludwig Ludwig kit that he was touring with this red one and he had this weird way of like putting a, a cymbal stand and attaching it to the kick drum so it didn't fall over whatever bullshit bullshit point being that it was a weird way to have his drum set up so years later Eric you know is in the band full time maybe two years later he's in the band full time start they start using John for all their local teching and stuff and Eric sees John the first day and he's like, I know you. And he goes, yeah, our bands, you know, toured together when you were playing with Alice Cooper. And he looks at him and he goes, oh, you were the guy that had that weird eye hook around the cymbal stand. He knows every single drum. We're fucking, we were on the phone last night just talking about the most. (laughs) Will you stop? (laughs) (laughs) But but about that same thing, you know, matter of fact, he just sent me this really cool Slingerland thing. (laughs) (laughs) It's not going to stop, Mark. No, come on, man. You know this. <laughs> Poor Anyways, Mark. it's cool. To, you're absolutely right. He's, 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 he's got that. Any sort of drum thing, he's like a savant with that. But he nailed it. I mean, he and then John was like, yeah. And then it was funny. Yeah, no, I just, you know, John loves all of those guys. He loves everybody in that camp. And, and he gets nervous if I ever associate him with it because he doesn't want them to ever think he's out telling anybody anything but and he doesn't but it's you know he really loves the whole camp loves all the people well they're all, all the great people yeah. you know they well, are being have... there tommy because you're tommy you know it everybody's that is an incredible camp yeah it's true it is true i have they also are all exceptional people i have not met one person that isn't 
uh, super kind and helpful and easy to talk to and excited to be there. I have met not one single person who doesn't love being a part of that. I'll tell you, the other band that I work with a lot is the is the Foo Fighters, and it's the same. I think that that has a lot to do with a band's longevity and their, you know, their success is the people, obviously the people that are working with them all the time. And it's the same thing. You, you'll find a lot like the, the, the people that, that manage you two are fabulous. You know, the people that manage the Foo Fighters are fabulous. And the, you know, obviously the kiss, the camp, the whole camp, the family, like when you walk around and you see people who've worked for somebody for over 20 years, you're like, Oh, okay. And it's not like you yeah. know, Disney or something. Right. It's just this like small company, basically. It's rad. Yeah. Well, and Foo Fighters are amazing. What, Great a, what guys. a talented group of people. Holy shit. Same thing. And they love, amazing. you know. And they're they Kiss fans. It. Yep, 100%. I mean, when Dave... All right, so I'll, I'll give you a story fast. When we did... <clears throat> the son I did, I did, I worked on that, or produced that show Sonic Highways with Dave, too. And yeah. We did the New York episode and we got to interview Paul. And, you know, like, that's, that's a, pr that's, you know, I'm going to tell you my favorite day on the whole show ever was being able to do that, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, Dave was like, you can, you can, because Dave did all the interviews himself and he said, you can write any question that you want to ask Paul on the question sheet. Like, write, write. Like anything you want to know, I'm asking Paul. So Paul will probably tell me because you know basically, I'm Dave Grohl. He's Paul Stanley. Hopefully we can get, ask him some questions that like, you know, he wouldn't answer for other people. So we had all these great questions and the interview's amazing and blah 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 and that. And my last question on that ship, or sorry, on that sheet was who steers the ship on a stormy sea? That was what I wanted. <laughs> I wanted him to ask. And he totally pussed out. Oh. oh. I was like, God damn it. You <laughs> know that he does not. That's you know, brilliant. You know, he does not look upon that record with much no. fun. No. No. I, I think he honestly thinks, I, I, I th just getting into Paul Stanley's head a little bit, I think now, you know, in 2020, he looks back at both, Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Park and The Elder is like, God, I wish we would have did not, something Not, not the proudest things we've ever done. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I put it this way. He certainly doesn't, uh, you know, he brings them up. But I, I, I think he'd be the first to admit that you know, probably a learning experience or, you know. But when you've been around that long, who doesn't have some of those? I'm absolutely right. You know. Dude, I have my own. Um in the you know in my life not just musically i have a few of those well I, so. every everybody yeah, yeah. if if everybody's <laughs> honest we've all made bad decisions where you're like oh you know i mean we've had shows where we're done and we we hit stop recording and the guest is gone and we look at each other and go man that was a train wreck <laughs> he's only saying yeah. that because that's how he feels now <laughs> <laughs> but but you know here, here's the funny thing jim you know, we still, we, we might look at it and go, something didn't feel right. It was a little off, but it was still us. And we still put it out there. And inevitably, half the fans go, that was the best interview you've ever done. And we're oh. sort of like, okay, I'm yeah. not going to try and figure it out, but we'll just keep doing what we think is right. I cannot, I cannot agree with you more. And just as... I have walked off a stage many times with our band and thought to myself, what a raging pile of shit we just presented <laughs> to those people. And people come up to you after the show and with genuine praise. And you're like, okay, sounds because, good to me. Because your perspective on that moment is so different. Yeah. Be you know, because I have that with, it seems like musicians in general have such a, uh, they can, they're consumed with these things that maybe are important to you as a musician, but when you're framing it and, and handing it to the fans, they don't see it the same way. So you could say, oh, I, I missed this chord or I played this solo poorly or whatever it was, and you weren't standing out in the audience experiencing the moment. Exactly. And that's the difference. You're right. It's like, you know, 
Most of it's the magic. It's like when I said, where, where I remember I told somebody, I, when I went to the Hot in the Shade tour, just to keep it on topic here, I remember I went to the Hot in the Shade tour, and I got, the next day I went to school, and I remember it was I was in high school, I'm pretty sure, and and I was in class, and I had to tell somebody, I was like, that was the the best musically like musically the best kiss show i've ever seen yep yeah like i don't know what's what was going on i don't know what the deal is and then when you know like i've i spent years like kind of like saying that quietly like well you know the best tour i ever saw was hot in the shade because you know people are going to be like are you out of your mind no, there's a lot of kiss oh, fans who we, share that yeah, no, we we all share that look so I, I i one of the i i never forget telling the story because I, I remember when Hot in the Shade came out, I hated it. I just yeah. I thought the record was terrible. But I remember shortly thereafter, and it was the Rip magazine cover with Gene and Paul and makeup on. And I happened to be out of town working. For, I had the time I was working for my family. And I got that, and I'm like reading through it, and I'm like, fuck, they're doing watching you. Because it was yeah. starting to talk about the, the tour and I, and I it was shortly thereafter I was going to see them and and I'll never forget man that that fucking show blew me away and this is the great thing about and to you younger fans look everyone raves about U2 and stuff it's better it was better for concerts before YouTube because we all remember mm -hmm. and I want you all of a sudden the fucking Although it was the crappy logo, it was still fucking cool when that thing came up there. And I want you because nobody, no, you didn't know that nobody expected it. it nobody expected. It. And, and again, going back to the whole timeline thing, going to, you know, I went to every tour through the eighties. I went to every tour from creatures of the night up until Sonic <laughs> boom. Yeah. And, and prior to the hot in the shade tour, in my opinion, the tours were getting worse and worse and worse. As much as I love the Crazy Nights album, the Crazy Nights tour was the absolute piece of shit tour in my mind. It yeah, was super the short. Too. It was a short set list. It, every nothing is was exciting about it. Uh -uh. But so so all of a sudden the Hot in the Shade tour comes around, and I'm going to it because it's a Kiss tour. I gotta go. Yeah. Like Mark, I wasn't overly excited about the album. The album was one of those going back to the talking about a producer where you're just like, this just doesn't sound like a well-produced album, but you're at the show. you expect, your expectations are not great because you're coming off of what you saw on the last tour. And all of a sudden, I stole your love starts playing. Yeah, you're like, I, I, I'm, I'm like, holy Arthur. crap. And then, then, then <laughs> you're seeing the Ibanez guitars back. And I'm like, oh, holy crap. And then, like Mark said, at the end, when it, you thought you'd already seen everything cool, the logo starts rising up. And I, to this day, I remember the goosebumps and the chills I got as a Kiss fan going, oh, my band. It's like they're rising from the ashes. This is the coolest thing in the world. So as a tour, phenomenal. Best, yeah. well, best, and, and best. I actually have a, a question with, you know, being that you're in a band. Do you think that most musicians, to Michael's point, are actually aware of what he was just describing and feeling? Because sometimes I think that some of those nuances get lost on the members of the band. And the same thing happened with this farewell tour, Sammy's back. That's huge for us as KISS fans. But I don't know if Gene or the other people in the band or whatever really realized the gravity of that. The little things. The difference between this band to me and most and most other bands was to your point, probably an accidental, um, what do you call it? And like, uh, uh, like I'm Motion like a, what is, oh, sorry. Uh, what do you call it? The happy accident? Yeah. That they were superheroes, you know, by accident, because if you put that in front of people and something that looks so larger than life and you build personas for each member, that are like basically like your guide to know what their personalities are. You know, like when you look at Joe 
and Steven and Joey and Tom, you know, like, you know them because we're dorks and we care about the people's names and bands, but they don't, it takes time for you to develop like what their personalities are and what their role is on stage and, and who they, you know, who they are in the band and their thing. Kiss gave that to you right up front. Like there was an origin story. It's like the only band yeah. where each member has an origin story, you know, wh- whether it's a complicated one or not, you know. And so it, it, it's going to lend itself to imagination way more than any other musical experience. Like your imagination is going to go crazy like we all did. You saw the album cover for Alive 2 and you saw Gene's face on that and you were like, this is a person? Like that, right. that is the demon he's pretending to be. Like... Well, and it's still, it, it feels that way to this day for me because you can be talking to one of them and it's no different than having a conversation like we are here. And then two hours later, out they come from the dressing rooms and all of their stuff and you're just like, still to this day, I'm just like, yeah, this is so, this is so it, awesome. You know, for, for, for me, I think what it, what it gets back to, you know, I got into Kiss 76 when I got Rock and Roll Over. Um, you know, and and... I was big into wrestling, which wrestling were were normal people with these alter ego characters mm-hmm. that that all they did was live that character because, you know, back in the 70s, you didn't know what was going on really behind the scenes in wrestling. You didn't know everybody was just a good guy and they were playing bad. Um, yeah. You know, and Superman comic books and everything else that were out and around during the 70s. With Kiss, they were truly real superheroes yes they weren't they you know i'm sorry superman and clark kent are not real they're just not they're in a comic book i know that i know it's just imagination but with kiss it was really a superhero because that's an actual person up on stage doing this i can be that and and there's a secret identity that they are keeping secret from the world Coolest. And 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 the and the media is trying to get that picture of them. And oh my God, you! I just saw a picture of Gene with a napkin over his mouth. You know, in the seventies, that was the the coolest thing in the world Ever. was just to you know see that kind of photo. Dude, it yeah. was it was so powerful and good that a, another band was able to do it later and also pull it off, which was the Slipknot guys at the beginning. Yeah. You're like, yep. we'll follow that exact same model, and it's so good that it will work again. And it's the same thing. I was same never ghost. Yeah, exactly. They well, even to a, a smaller degree because they weren't total arc alter egos, but you know, Motley Crue had a bit of that too. Yeah. They certainly pressed that for Shout at the Devil. Something I think all of us, because we're although Jim, we're a little bit older than you are. Yeah. Um, I'm doing a lot of with uh, the, some of this downtime. I'm. One of my favorite things to collect are, are newspaper clippings, and I'm, oh, cool. I'm really crazy on it. Anyways, I was just going through something that, and I totally forgot about this. This was from like the Detroit Free Press. Like they used to have this thing in where fans could write in. So I mean, it's, it's a major newspaper, but <laughs> where f- people sent in this thing that the, you know, basically the jig is up. We've finally figured it out that that Van Halen is Kiss without makeup. Amazing. You know what I mean? That kind of... Again, I, I totally forgot I had that clipping, and I was like... This you was, need to share that. This is 1970. You know, I, it, it's, again, it's sitting over on my desk. And, I mean, and it's, I, it's not something I can go grab readily, but, I'll, you know, because even on the Three Sides page, I've been putting some stuff up. Um, yeah, I you know, I, I should have taken a picture of that one. Uh, matter of fact... I know Michael and Tommy probably saw it. I, I don't know if you have. Back in 1996, uh, MTV censored yeah. the I shouted out loud. I told, again, going through all this stuff, I forgot about that. And I'm like, you got to be kidding. I mean, especially what in a few, literally a couple of years difference, mm-hmm. the, you know, especially with the hip hop videos and the AKs and the drug use and, and I'm like, geez, oh man, you guys censored a, basically yeah. a you know a guy in a clown costume breathing fire who's been doing it for Ever. thirty years. <laughs> well, I mean, literally, what's the difference between that? Seriously, you want to talk about MTV? 
how many times did you see like in, in Motley Crue videos or something? Someone blowing fire or something? Yeah. That happened all. I just thought it was weird. You know what I mean? But it was an actual. That was an actual news story. The cool thing about Kiss is that they've always been. I mean, and I'm sure they wouldn't agree with this statement, but they've always been underestimated. And I think that's also part of the part of the whole thing of why they have such you know fans that are so into them. It's like most of yeah. you know, like I was very underestimated as, as a youth, and you know, it's kind of like that thing. And what you said before, you know, keep the keep the opinions out of your space. You know, anybody who's telling you that you're a crazy person for thinking that you could do something, they're you know, I forget what you said before when we started. No, I, um, I, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Yeah, you know, I, I, I would actually say, though, I think Gene and Paul will admit they've always been underestimated. They've always been the yeah. underdogs. They've always, yeah. they've always never been, they've never been, this leads up to why the Elder happened. They've never been given the dues for being songwriters well, and musicians. Yeah. They've always heard it's just bombs, pyro, and makeup. Well, no, it's not. And they proved that during the 80s when the makeup came off and they sold 10 million albums in that decade alone with no makeup on. Um, but as fans, yeah, we've we've lived that. I mean, we've we've talked about that so many times, especially, you know, I was in I remember 1979 and I'm in high school. And, you know, my, my fun little story was I finally had gotten around to getting some cash to join the KISS Army, and I sent it in. Mm-hmm. Well, that was when they, because KISS was bottoming out by 79. Right. Uh, they closed the <laughs> KISS Army. It was closed. It was no longer they operating. Yeah. They sent me back a nice letter that said, we're sorry, we're closed, blah, blah, blah. But here's a couple couple things for you to say we're sorry. And they sent me, like, a, a love gun iron-on transfer and a Dynasty Tour t-shirt. Huh. And I remember high school going, you know, I want to wear my KISS shirt to school. And literally having to stop and go, am I prepared for the shit I'm going to take walking into high school in 1979 with a KISS Dynasty t-shirt? So and I'm weird. Like, and I'm like, fuck <coughs> it, I love this band. It is my band. I'm wearing it. And But sure enough... You know, walking down the hall, going to lunch, Kiss sucks, Kiss can't play, Led Zeppelin, all the time. I mean, we were all exposed to that at some yeah. level, no matter when you got into Kiss. Kiss never got their just dues, and we've seen that all the time, getting back to, well, why wasn't that song a hit? Why wasn't that video a hit? Because the industry never took them seriously. Yeah, it's the truth. <laughs> I mean, the Rolling Stone thing... And then not, you know, never, uh, not even, rec- you know, not even recognizing when Eric Carr died. I mean, it's just like, that's... Yeah, that was an F you. That's, yeah, that was, that that's the worst one. I mean, that, like, left, as a fan, that left the worst taste in my mouth for that magazine. Like, I've never really kind of recovered from that, for that magazine, where you're just like, you know what? This guy made millions of people happy. Millions of people. And uh, fuck you. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of people that felt that way. And because, again, it goes back to that whole thing about Rolling Stone magazine picking their favorites. <laughs> and the people that work there didn't understand our age group and the stuff that we were interested. That's really what it came down to. And I still have this debate today with friends of mine that are maybe five, ten years older than me that still think Bob Dylan is, if you're not Bob Dylan, you're just you're not good. And it's like, well, there's nothing wrong with Bob Dylan, but he didn't speak for my generation. And and it's, it's just not the same thing. It's also not fucking fun. Well, that's, that's, that's exactly it. To me, kiss has always been fun, positive attitude. I mean, say what you want about their lyrics and some of their songs, but I know, I know, I know what all you guys would, would agree. I mean, their attitude has always been, don't take shit from anybody. Do whatever you want, regardless of what somebody thinks. It's your life, not their life. You know, uh, you know. A lot of people will will poo poo the Crazy Nights album, but the song "My Way" is just like the epitome of that. I'm doing this yeah. band my way. 
Mm-hmm. And and then you know at the beginning of the album it's crazy crazy nights, a million strong. I'm sorry, you can't deny that there was even in in what some people might call their lowest period, there was still millions and millions of fans. But that even were believing uh, in them, that was kind of that you know that that this genre of music in the '80s was getting such a, you know, for the most part it was just the sensational part that you know like the devil shit and all that crap that was getting the attention when if you listen to a Dio record I mean it's all it's like Tony Robbins for 13 year old boys you know like stand up and shout and stuff I mean like you know it's like (laughs) that's a great description but I mean honestly all it is is like Dio's telling you like you kick ass and you you know you can do it and well don't you think though let's get off on a little tangent that way I thought after I thought after last in line Dio was really a parody of himself yeah i mean i we again not to be douchebag and you can you know get your get the bell ready but we we toured we toured with dio and <laughs> <laughs> i love it he's already into this bit and actually you know you know the um the uh and you can if you ding for this person she'll be really happy but the reason why we got introduced was because of a mutual friend named megan sweeney and yep. man, there you go. See, she'll she'll appreciate it. But Michael, uh, we she flew in from uh, Columbia for work right to our show with Dio at the um, can't remember where it was in San Francisco. But anyways, long story short, Dio became you know like everybody in our band got pretty close to him because he was such a good person. And you're right, like it did become like you know it became a thing. Look, I, I'm. Yeah, as, I know. As, as Mike and Tommy know, I mean, anything Richie Blackmore, I'm, I love. Obviously, deal. Black Sabbath's one of my all-time favorites. I'm a totally geeky, huge yeah. mega fan. But if I'm honest with myself, after Last in Line, you kind of gets funny. Every, yeah, it 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 just kind of rainbows and dragons, and you know, it was just like it. it don't get me wrong. I, oh, Strange Highways, I I, I dug. Um, yeah, there's some era. stuff. Yeah, every, some... every 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 record, there's always a you know couple. Yeah, but but that's it. But you know, at the same time, the the, the whole power metal thing, and it it just, I don't know. It. No, I'm I made a fan. I bought all the stuff. It just it it wasn't as special to me, and I still to this day refuse to call the later day heaven and hell. No, it's Black Sabbath. It yeah, was Black it Sabbath all the way to the end, and I arguably. I think the song Bible Black is one of the greatest Black Sabbath songs ever. And that's, you know, that was later on in the in the career on the Heaven and Hell stuff. But that, Dio always kept it in him. But, I mean, at times... He believed it. He believed it. Like, no matter what. Which is, the, which is why people, you know, if you... It's like anybody that could be successful in music in my, you know, in my advanced years here. I've realized... Even the bands that we've toured with that I don't particularly like their music. It's like, if you believe what you're doing, you're making great music. Like, yeah. if you if you can, you know, if if you walk off the stage every night or you walk out of the studio when your record's done and you, you're, like, every piece of in here is in that, then it's good. Whether it's, I like it or not. Right, it's going to reach the correct people. You know, my biggest issue with Dio was exactly what you just said, Mark. I was completely turned off by the whole sorcerers and, you know, unicorns and shit. It just doesn't do anything for me. Yeah, it it lost me then to time. Put it this way. I still bought the records, Mm -hmm. but I, I, it wasn't something that, because at that point, honestly, I was buying the records, hope, hoping I'd get a, a couple tunes that I, I like. I, you know, when he was switching to Greg Goldie and the band was rotating, it, it, you know, this is the same but different. The, you know, the Holy Diver and Last in Line, in some ways, are like Blizzard of Oz and Dire of a Madman. They're both done by the you know, same yep. bands. They, they were done fairly quickly. That that catching lightning in a bottle sort of thing. And then, you know, the rest of it wasn't as good. And, yeah. and 
Although Ozzy was fortunate to have Bob Daisley with him for a good chunk of his career, who, as you guys, I would hope know, Ozzy don't write. That Most of that stuff was Bob and Randy Rhodes, and then oh, yeah. Bob and Jakey Lee. Uh, Ozzy's not a songwriter. You, I mean, I'm sure you've read the, the Bob book, right? The Daisley book? Oh, yeah, yeah. For fact's sake, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a good one. You, you know, yeah, you know, I, I, I tell you what, that's one I highly recommend. I, I I would love to add to listen. I'm a uh, there's no denying it, I'm a big fan of 80s rock, 80s metal, but to to what you're talking about with Dio, almost everything by the end of the 80s was turned into a parody. The 80s mm -hmm. started out. I mean, look at Motley Crue shout at the devil. There's nothing more real, honest than that. But you look at where all these bands ended up by the end of the 80s. They, they were, were all listening to someone else. They were all parodies. They were listening to, they were trying to be better than Bon Jovi, Def Leppard, mm -hmm. Motley Crue, whoever. And then, and then I think the 80s is when you really had record label influence step in big time. Because all right. of a sudden there was so much money to be made. And right or wrong there were some clear formulas that were established especially yes. for hard rock bands that the labels were like you're following this formula or i'm not giving you a record deal that formula consists of you got to have your hair this way you got to have these kind of clothes you got to write these kind of songs and these kind of lyrics oh you don't want to do that well we're not giving you the budget for the next album then so it's sort of like we got you by the balls mm -hmm. and these bands start churning well, you, out what's not they didn't churn out a pure elder but they are moving in that direction where they're no longer doing what they want they're doing what everybody else wants them yeah. to do rat is rat is one of the biggest uh ver, ver, you know examples in my opinion of what you're saying because i mean that band wrote hit songs and just Bad decision after bad decision after bad decision. I mean, whether you like the band or not, they yeah. wrote songs that were hits on the radio. Oh, I love them. Awesome band. Yeah. yeah, and they, you know, it's like, to me, I always get super bummed because you're just like, they should have been a thing. Like, they should have been a bigger band, and they shouldn't. But that legacy, you know, hanging on to that legacy after, like you just said, you've made these weird decisions that, like, and it's funny because you saw the same thing happen to 90s bands. I mean, a lot of the 90s bands, you know, started off strong and then it was just kind of like. Yeah. You know a band, though, that I I thought musically and, and as, as both Tommy and, and, my, and Michael know, I, I generally don't like hair metal. And but some bands, yeah. I think, defy that. cat. I think Tom Kiefer's fantastic. Well, I was just going to tell you, Cinderella. Yeah, yep. Cinderella's a great Amazing. example of that. Um, But. Faster Pussycat. That second record's. I mean, that's a. I always say the second, uh, uh, the second Faster Pussycat album is the greatest Aerosmith album that Aerosmith didn't perform on. I because those totally songs agree. where you know where there's a whip, there's a way, and the, that's fucking classic Aerosmith. That band had so much groove and swing that. And then um, what's the one with uh, uh, what was the. Whipped was the one after that. Yeah, I yeah. like that one too. Train to Nowhere, Last of the Whatever. Motherfucker, that album's dynamite. Mm -hmm. And and again though too, it, it got it got lost because that yeah. band, Faster Ooh. Pussy, it was just fucking awesome. But and I gotta admit, to I remember that. when I first saw a picture of them, I thought they were gonna suck. But I'm one of those guys that would just still go to the record store and buy it. Just yeah, because see. I had enough friends that said, you should check this out. And now that's one of those bands that I, I love. I have the entire catalog, bootlegs. I mean, I, I love Faster Pussy. Same with Rat. I, I really did Rat. I remember when I first round and round, and I'm still not a big fan of that song. It doesn't yeah. suck. It's not a big fan, but man, that catalog's fantastic. But do yeah. you think, do you think, though, that some of these bands we're talking about, uh, specifically Faster Pussycat, timing-wise, a little of their thunder was taken away from them by the insane amount of popularity that Guns N' Roses grabbed? Yeah, for to, sure. To a degree, but I also think, though, and this is another example of 
of style over substance because the substance was so good. The first Wasp record. Oh, don't even don't. That's my favorite '80s band of all time. Dude, the vocal. Hold on, the vocal melodies, the layering of the vocal. Uh, that record is just a phenomenal album. Tommy, let's sit but, back. Welcome to the Wasp podcast, people. Yeah, go ahead, guys. Let her, our fans no, but, are going to love. Our fans are going to love this. So you guys go and have a Wasp. No, but Jim knows what I'm talking about, especially being a fellow musician. Those songs are insane. Dynamite. Insane. I mean. Nikki, here, hit the bell, but Nikki Six told me once, because I ask him all the time questions, uh, you, you know, about shit that he hasn't probably thought about and fucking, you know, and probably forgot about due to what he's done to his brain. But um, I ask him about Blackie all the time. And he said, he's, he, he will, you know, he will, he'll admit, like, that guy is just, you know, there's a massive amount of talent that will never have been appreciated because he was such a great songwriter and such a visionary guy when it came to like, he's like everybody in this town, I'm in LA was looking at what he was doing. Like everybody looked at him and was like, what is Blackie doing? That's what we should be doing. And Nikki said, the story he told me was, you know, like I'd be getting a blow job from a girl and get and punching a guy in the face on the street and Blackie would come around the corner and see me and he'd go, what are you doing? Like, you're a talented guy. Like what? Like he was totally the guy that like basically told Nikki, like you just got, if you want to make this a a thing, you got to be a, you know, one of you has to be an adult. Like you have to have an adult (laughs) in the room because you know, a, you're going to be massively taken advantage of and B you probably will kill yourself. I mean, you know, and history took its course, but Blackie is just one of those dudes where I, you know, I, I don't know, just never gets the credit. I mean, dude, if they, uh, I, and, and they're another one in the catalog, I'll find something on every record that I think is amazing. You know, like even, I mean, even the last, even the last record I thought was great. The last one that, that he just put out, but they'll never come back. You know, they'll never come to the States. He just won't do it. Well, you no, know, no, to, to Blackie's credit, he did have a Grammy Award-winning producer record on his album. <laughs> <laughs> Inside joke to Bob. Yes. But, yeah, I mean, just songwriting-wise, I mean, Blackie just had it. I, it, it, it Put it this way, it was too good for the genre. That's totally right. Yeah, it's it's in the skill level. It, it just everything about it. It, I, I don't know how that didn't get. Well, I do know how. I I think people didn't take it serious. They didn't judge it on the music. They judged it on the album cover. Kind of the opposite of Kiss, though, too, because that record sounds fucking. If 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 you don't have the very first Wasp album, go get yeah. it or. Go to Spotify. Or stop I want to be somebody. There's another song. How come I want to be somebody isn't on classic rock radio in all the time? But oh, that. But you know, yeah. you know, to 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 your point. I mean, you know, when Wasp came out, because I was huge into Wasp the first few albums. I kind of lost it over the years. But you know, when they came out, they were known for basically two things, and this is what. They were being promoted for, and this is what the media was was grabbing onto. Animal fuck like a beast. Yeah. And strapping women on stage and, and you know, throwing raw meat around. It's like, t- to Mark's point, you're not getting noticed for your songwriting because you're so extreme in a couple of these things right out of the box to shock people. That's what I mean. It, it that got more attention than the music did, and by it, all things being equal, the music was good enough that you didn't need it. No, I agree. It could have been a it could have been a whole different career for all those guys. I, I still I another I don't know how Love Machine didn't take off as a single. I, mean, so I was going to say that too, but just before that's a great song. So why why won't they tour the states? I don't know anything about them. The so, same reason uh, that 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 Twisted Sister wouldn't now anyway. Yeah, go, go work for three weeks in Europe playing festivals, 
Why do you need to come over here and play fucking clubs for half the money? Yeah, or Russia. You know, like, just do a couple, like, Ukraine festivals. Like you said, it's, like, easy, easy, you know, I always say, only in America is everybody too cool. Only only in the States are fans too cool to like their the music that they want to, that they like, if that makes any sense. Yeah, but I guess I was surprised that not even in the Midwest that they wouldn't have enough following where they could uh, but, but, get but the, 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 the problem just is promoters in general in the U.S. Mm-hmm. aren't going to pay bands mm-hmm. the money they need to be able to go on the road in the U.S., which remember, you know, you can you can tour Europe in two weeks. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, right. you don't tour the U.S. in two weeks, mm-hmm. um, is, is and 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 not validate? lose not lose their their shirt touring the U.S. I mean, that's just what it comes down to. Yeah, like for our band, I mean, like we can go to, you know, we could go do four festivals, and you know, like genre festivals. You know, yeah. like stoner rock stuff and desert rock stuff. And we could do four of those in Europe in four different countries and make as much as we'll do on like a southern states run here. You know, so it's like, again, like, why not just go do it easy with fans that actually are like super amped to see you there? Oh, I, I totally understand that. I guess my question is, is why couldn't they end up on some of the stuff here think, in the states like uh, Rock in Oklahoma and or? You know. I think he doesn't want to be associated with like the the hair thing, maybe like you know the eighty like uh, like you know to your to 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 Mark's point. I mean, he was he's a great songwriter, and and I'm sure there's part of him that regrets you know doing all that theatrical stuff because the songs were so good. So who knows? I mean, I would go. I saw them last time. I saw them. We actually opened for them at the House of Blues here in L.A., and uh, it was like it was right before Chris Holmes left the last time. And they were, I mean, it was still awesome. Like it was, but, you're still like, yeah, there's all the songs. But, but you know, I mean, even now to some extent, aren't they being sort of a parody? Because I remember when I saw a picture recently of Blackie and his goddamn half motorcycle oh, microphone, yeah, you know, and I'm just like, what is this? What that? It's a it's a joke. Just sing into a microphone. I don't need you hiding behind this huge stage prop on the front of the stage. That in itself is a bit of a parody. Well, you become so detached, you know, like from what's, you know, like you you have to you have to stay current, you know, and you have to stay relevant, and that's the hardest part for all anybody that makes this stuff, you know, like. Grohl is a great example of how to do that, you know, how to like maneuver through, you know, the decades and be relevant, you know, with each group of people because your fans grow with you, right? Age wise. Yep. Yep. So it's like, just keep that in mind and you'll probably do well. Blackie doesn't really understand that. Like if he wants to get a younger audience, you can't like all the shtick is, is kind of like everybody thinks you're being ironic when you're doing the shtick, even if your shtick is, you know, to the, you is legitimate. The, in in 2020, the shtick is what people laugh at about the 80s. Yes, and that's so. Don't don't put throw it in their face. You know, like I mean, Kiss. The like again, since Kiss is such an institution at this point, like they get this, they get a pass. But to your point about the story with the with the dynasty shirt, and in school, there was definitely a time where all of us weren't getting a pass for loving that band. Well, listen, like, I mean, there, there were, you know, you, I, people would get that reaction in the 80s. Nobody would take Kiss seriously. Mm-hmm. It's just like, oh, okay, great, it's a Kiss concert. They're not musicians. But, but, but to Kiss's point, that's what they've always come out from the very beginning to be about. They stood their ground when... When right at the right out of the box, Casablanca and Warner Brothers were like, "We want you to drop the makeup," and they're like, "Uh, uh-uh, uh, we're not dropping the makeup." Yeah, you know, they stood their ground through all of the shit, but they are, you know, they are known for the huge production. So that shtick, in the case of Kiss, is Kiss's shtick. That's what Kiss yeah. is known for. Yeah. You know, when you when when you see some of these '80s bands still trying to tour, you're sort of like, oh, you know that '80s that 
80s shtick doesn't work anymore. Be the musician you are, be the songwriter you are, be the great vocalist, the great guitar player. Don't worry about trying to recreate what you were like on the stage 40 years ago. Yes. I, 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 it's, you know, I think there's really only ever been top to bottom soup to nuts, one conceptually perfect band. And I think it was by accident and it's the Ramones, you know, like they all had the same outfit. They had very similar hairdos, obviously the names, and it was easy shit that was always going to be timeless, like jeans and leather jackets and t-shirts, like conceptually that works through every generation. Like, I would add cheap trick to that too. That's true. Because they're just they could be the perfect rock band. They really yeah, you could. can it doesn't matter what era you're in. They're they're they fit in fine. Yeah. So 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 Jim, just to give all of us a little bit of, of your KISS background, when did you first discover KISS and how did it happen? Um I grew up in New Jersey and there was a house, you know, at, at this time you could walk to school, you know, you would be like seven years old and you would walk to school because that's going to happen now. Right. <laughs> um, in New Jersey. So I would walk past this kid in my class's house. His name was Jerry Maglioni and his older brothers were the older brothers that, you know, like me and the other kids that were my age in the neighborhood all saw those guys and were like, someday, though, someday we'll be those guys. And I was at their, at his house, a sleepover in the basement. And he had, um, he had that originals box set, like the three records right. and the originals. And that was the first time I heard it. And then I remember the, the vibe I remember the the feeling from, and this was uh, 1977, maybe 70. Yeah. Around there. And I just remember I never was into Superman or, or like, you know, Marvel superheroes and shit. And I just remember seeing that and thinking to myself, like they're people, but they're not, you know, like the conversation we had before, that was the thing that drew me in. Like I can be that I can, this is something I can actually do because they're real people. And that was what was always the appeal to me. And again, it's like when you grow up listening to them and, and you know, being a, a lunatic and learning everything you can about them, you know, the beauty of it is, you know, fuck you, I won't do what you tell me, right? Like the original version of that is those guys. Like, no, we, you know, we got this. We're gonna put clown makeup on and a bunch of leather outfits and we're gonna play, you know, Classic rock, you know, rock and roll music, and it's going to work fine. On paper, that doesn't ever get a check written for it, ever. Like in a pitch room, if you tell somebody that, they're like, this isn't going to happen. But those guys believed it. That's the coolest part of that band. You know, it's like, it's kind of like Howard Stern when you hear him talk about like his life and how everybody was always telling him how wrong he was and how, you know, what the thing that he knew in his heart would be the thing that made him, you know, a thing everybody denied and then he just kept you kept forging on all the bands that we love are bands that's going to be the story everyone has told everyone in every band that's successful that they sucked and that what they were doing was irrelevant and nonsensical i promise every yeah. single person in every band has that story yeah it, it all comes down to what how do you how do you react when you're told that do you yeah do you throw the towel in do you change yourself or do you stick to what you believe in and remain honest and go well fuck you i'm this is the music i love i love uh -huh. putting on clown makeup when everybody else is saying you got to be bob dylan screw that yeah. yeah but the hard part for me as a kiss fan was through the 80s where they used to be the trendsetter for what they did and then they became in they became the chasing element yeah after bon jovi or hart or whoever well, you know that, that 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 in my opinion that started basically in 1979 that's as a kiss fan you got your first taste of oh mm, disco not disco kind of poppy and then then unmasked then the elder that was the first signs of them not following, setting their own trend, but trying to follow other trends. 
Mm-hmm. Now, Creatures brought it back, and I think Lick It Up was fine. But once the 80s settled in, you're spot on. Then they just became totally, well, we need to get to that next level. And Crazy Nights was the epitome of that. We need to get to that next level. We're going to wait a year and a half just to get Ron Nevison because look what he did with Ozzy and Hart. And we'll be bigger than Bon Jovi and Def Leppard. You know, that was chasing the trends. And then, then you but you're kind of old, but you're kind of too old now. You know, yeah. like, that was the weird thing. Like you're in that weird yeah. age where it's well, like. And, and to your point earlier, I still really like the songs on Crazy Nights. It's I not all of them, but most. But I bag on that record because of the production. And that's the issue more for me. Isn't the songs, but it was the weird, colorful outfits and. And the whole time I remember having conversations with other KISS fans going, why can't they just come out dressed in black leather? And then when they finally did it in Revenge, I'm like, this, they is, are. this yeah. is our band. Well, you know, you know go back to a, a what if. What if in 1979, wait, you know, another six months till it's almost, you know, because that album was released in what, May of 79. There was something on... You know, in that, you know, that kind of music, meaning, you know, Highway to Hell was just hidden. You know what I mean? And, and hard rock, to a degree, still had a, a you know, a, a fan base. And that was part of the big problem. Kiss pissed all over that fan base with I Was Made for Love and You. Yeah. They did get the hit they wanted, but they alienated a bunch of people who were with them for a long time. That's what happened. And that's how come, you know, again, they abandoned their, put it this way, Unmasked is a the soundtrack to 16 Magazine. There was nothing offensive about it. There was nothing, there was no almost human on that. You it's know not going mean? to piss was... off anybody's parents if they heard no. you playing Correct. If that, Unmasked yeah, that or, they saw the, or they saw the Unmasked cover. Nobody's getting pissed about it. You're, you're, that's exactly my, my point. What if Kiss would have, you know, made a, another hard rock record in 19, you know, and then stuck to it? I would have, would things have been different? I don't know. I mean, would they be like ACDC? Yeah. Or, or you know, like, would it be, because, you know, like people, I mean, at the time, people probably didn't take ACDC very seriously, but, you know, now, People take ACDC extremely seriously. So yeah, but go back in time. Had they, of course, these are the misses they would have. These are the things they would have had to avoided in order to stay in the ACDC trajectory. They could. They, they had. To, they would have had to avoid the movie. They would have had to avoid the solo records. Had they just keep in mind in 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 March of 1978, Kiss. You know, and, and Kiss was still playing you know, big hockey arenas. They were still seen as dangerous and hard rock. Keep in mind that the, the, that tour, the Alive tour ended, or Alive 2 tour ended in March of 78. You know, the Dynasty tour started in June of 79. So it's just barely a year later. And in many, many ways, they were a different band. Yeah. But also, too, here's the thing that's different for me with ACDC. You may like one record over another, and there's a few you don't care for, and there's a few you love. But at least from an outsider's perspective as a casual fan, they have been consistent since day one. It's like, oh, you love this song? Well, here's another one that sounds just like it. And it's been that way since the beginning. So the fans of ACDC, when they buy that new record, they know exactly what's inside that package. It's like Motorhead. Oh, but, yep. Yeah, yep. hold on. But and there's but nothing wrong bands, with that. Hold on, but I'm a geek fan of both of those bands. Razor's Edge, no. Terrible. Same thing with, uh, what's the, um, is it Ball Bad? Breaker? What's the stand on it? Oh, no, no. Fly on the Wall. No, no, no. That, no, that record too. But I'm, I'm now I'm jumping ship over to Motorhead. What's the one with Stand on it? Oh, um, uh, and is it Bastards? Yeah, that's the one that starts with Burner. Mm-hmm. You know, the Burner's great. What's the, what's the one? Because it, God, it's I think it's got Stand. Although I like the song Stand, it's the one that's got like Slash guests on it. It's fucking terrible. Oh, that's like later, like Snake Bite Love or one no, of no, those. No, no, no. It's before that. This is before. Really. That. Anyways, make a long story short. 
both Motorhead and ACDC have blips, more so ACDC, have some major blips on the radar. But do they um, have the? Do they literally have something as blippy as the Elder? No. No, but see, theirs worked because Razor's Edge was huge. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, but, but, it, but, but as somebody who's an ACDC geek, I can't stand Money Talks. No, I fucking hate that song. I understood, but here's the thing: to a casual fan like me, Money Talks hearing that on the radio sounds exactly like you shook me all night long to me there's no difference so you may have as a hardcore acdc fan not cared for that record but the general record buying public who listened to fm radio acdc was as consistent as could be all the way through that's the difference because they had the fm support whereas kiss because they kind they had the makeup they had the image they were already kind of pigeonholed into a certain thing. Now you're going to have even a harder time getting your new fans involved when there's no support anywhere and you've got the hardcore fans just bailing on you. At least from my perspective, even people I knew back in the day would bitch about one ACDC record or another, but it didn't seem to bother them because they had so many others that were just fantastic to them. I don't well, like you know, either in a lot of anomaly. I would say... Kiss had more FM success. We're hearing them date, you know, more so on the radio during the '80s because "Lick It Up" got played more than at least on FM radio here. Lick I mean, it other up, than "Heavens on Fire," fire "Tears Are Falling." Yeah. yeah, but if you look at our our market, I would disagree with that. Even though those songs were on, man, on like KQ, they played the catalog. So they would still, even to this day, when ACDC puts out a new record, they typically will pay, play that first single, and they'll play it in heavy rotation. One of the few bands I think they actually do that with, but at any other given time of the day, you're going to hear three to five cuts off of Back in Black. You're going to hear several cuts off of uh, Highway to Hell, and they went back when they re-released, what was it, Dirty Deeds? I mean, seriously, it's one right after the other all the time. And so a lot of the general rock fans i don't know if they know the difference that's interesting because i certainly didn't you know and i hung around friends that were you know what i got i got to tend to agree with um tommy on this i mean i'm not i'm not a huge diehard acdc fan i mean honestly back in black was my first acdc album when it came out because it was just monstrous even when it came out um but yeah to to some extent it's like Eh, you know, it's all pretty much going to sound ACDC-ish. Yet to, some of it's a little better, some of it's a little worse. But is there anything that's as drastic as Kiss going to Unmasked or Kiss going to The Elder or Kiss no. doing Carnival of Souls? I don't think ACDC ever deviated to those that, that extent like Kiss did. And I'm not no. saying this is unique I'll to Kiss. I'll give you another but example, is... and we're old, we're old enough to remember this. Although their their music did vary to a degree when In Through the Outdoor came out, that was Zeppelin, especially stuff like Carousel Ombra, and that was quite different from, you know, Achilles' Last Stand and, you know, stuff that they were playing just a couple years earlier, you know. Um, although right. I, you know, I like In Through the Outdoor, too, but that's also a special time. I was just starting ninth grade, and in uh, 79 and stuff but you know all of my love didn't sound like the one no. or you know what i mean no. but the thing is is that again i would use zeppelin as another example it didn't seem to matter because they pushed they play in on the in through the outdoor which is my favorite zeppelin record they play fool in the rain they play uh, all of my love and one other track off of that record to this day still in the evening Huh? In the evening, in heavy rotation, along with uh, "Hey, um, Hey, Hey, What Can I Do?" The Ocean, uh, on and on and on and on and on. So it was another thing that even if these bands had a record that didn't sound like the rest of them, when you have that FM push behind you, mm-hmm. it didn't seem to matter. Mm-mm. No, I, I, I scrutinized, I, but that's why I was saying though. Too, I, I think Kiss's catalog 
has enough songs of that kind of caliber where they could have been played. You know, Shout It Out Loud is a fantastic yes. FM classic rock song, but you almost mm-hmm. never hear it. Mm-hmm. But but and but, I, but I, I think I, I think that back to the seventies and eighties that should have been on the radio more. It's but but to to song. to that exact point, Mark. Now yes, you're going to hear a deep Kiss catalog on classic rock radio. But when Kiss was quote an active recording, you know, fresh band, nobody was touching that because Kiss was looked down at by the industry in general as a joke band. And bubblegum. Yeah, yeah, they were bubblegum. They weren't musicians. We're not playing Led Zeppelin and ACDC going into shout it out loud, even though Destroyer is becoming a huge hit. You know, Kiss didn't get that recognition at the time. Yeah, now, now again, looking back, hindsight, they're getting it all because everybody finally acknowledged their in, influence and importance in the music world. But when they, when you know, when those were new albums, when Rock and Roll Over was a new album, no, wh- nobody was touching anything off of that. Nothing, and that's. An amazing, not just one of the, in my opinion, the best Kiss album. I agree. It's one of the best hard rock albums out there. It's just solid from start to finish. I totally agree. I love the sound of that record. Oh, and by the way, that Motorhead record is March or Die. That's I thought of that. One. I thought of that three about eighteen seconds ago. I have to use the bathroom very badly. All right. No, All right. no that is not allowed. <laughs> I'll be right back. All right. <laughs> good discussion. This is this is a good yeah. one. Yeah. Well, I, you know, these are fun shows. I like doing ones like this. Yeah. Are... It's, this is like an intelligent discussion. Well, come on. Let's not push the boundary. <laughs> <laughs> well, we did That's lose. Right some, yeah. You know, we 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 did lose. Inte- accused of that. We did lose some intelligence when we went down that wasp hole. Mm, yeah. By the way, Tommy, great great picks, man. What? Oh, thanks. I'm just doing. I'm just editing them a little bit more because I've been in my office all week, and I want to keep giving Michael fresh stuff to post. Because the listeners seem to like it. So. Oh yeah, they love. Oh, them. Mike. Uh, that's one thing. Why we got a second. When when do you want to start doing stuff with my band? Like, um, I'm I'm finishing up tonight. Um, all of the settings to take it not live live, but get it submitted. Um, and then I will hit you up with like when I want to do a press release on this, when we want to do the video release on this. So I'll get you all that sort of stuff in the next 24 hours. Oh, yeah, because, like, I haven't even showed anybody the record cover yet. I mean, you two guys, but, I mean, I didn't I, – I don't know anything about promoting. This is all new to me, so I don't know anything about it. I mean, we're, we're – we're, You know, we're, years ago, we just put out a record, and we'd go play local shows and give them away and sell whatever. I mean, that, but this is totally different. Yeah, no, know? no. You know, we're, 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 we're good from a time-wise standpoint in that – um, you know, what did we set? May 29th as the release yeah, date. which is my birthday. Yeah, so, you know, Mark's birthday present is his album coming out. But, you know, part of this is... I want to show you guys something. I, I want to make sure we work into all of the free side stuff. You know, mentioning the album, pushing the album, and all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because pre-sale goes on... On the thirtieth, you said thirtieth of April, I think, is when we set that. So, if somebody orders it in pre-sale, will it be shipped and sent to them the day of no the release? No, there's no, there's no physical goods, Tommy. It's oh, just going right. to be a digital release. So, if you pre-order the album on the thirtieth, you're going to get a couple of the singles immediately. But on May 29th, the entire album just shows up in your iTunes. What did I miss? Yeah. iTunes. Oh, Mark, Mark, Mark's got a band called Left for Dead that's oh, um, right. releasing an album. So, And I'm helping him set that up for distribution and release and promotion and and all of that. Is this a band you've been in for a while? Yeah, a long time. We've released a bunch of records, except that we just sell them at local shows. Well, I don't know what things are like out, out where you are. But fuck it. I, matter of fact, it was funny because on, on our last... We haven't released a record in ten years. 
But our last one, you know, all the the clubs and stuff we played at here in Detroit, I think 100% of them are gone. Yeah. It's like, no, because we play all original, like, hard rock, you know, and A, there's, like, no places just for bands to play, period, let alone somebody that wants to come in there and play their own music. It's hard. I mean, I'm exaggerating to a bit, but there's only, like, one or two places, and, you know, I have to book the show whereas i you know i gotta get a band to come in before us and you know just uh it's just weird now you is know? harpo's still open well I, yeah as long as i got a flamethrower and a fucking uh you know what i'm talking about i sure do yeah. and um harpo's and st andrews are the two places that we've played the most yeah st andrews is still st andrews is still there that that place still does. I will. I'm all kidding aside. Harpo's is pretty much just dead. Done. They don't think anybody even books there anymore. Right. Last show I saw there was Testament, um, but that was on two records ago. I don't even think they open anymore for. And that area of Detroit is so. I mean, it was bad back then. I was in a band in the '80s that we were damn near the house band there. I was playing there almost every weekend. It's an awesome place. Yo, know, oh, are you kidding me? That that place. Matter of fact, just Ken, I've been just going through stuff. I found a bunch of board tapes that I had from you know we played there back in the day and stuff. And it was it was a just it was a great scene. It was a great vibe. I used to joke because they were open Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and I, you know I always used to say if they just had a McDonald's in there and everyone left. You know I was there, and I mean all the nationals came through there, and you know it was just a. That was that was uh, and again we opened for tons of national. It was it was just a lot of fun, you know. Well, you were you again. You were there. They had the the upstairs, you know. Uh, the upstairs backstage was cool, and that was when you were headline. It was fun because mm-hmm. you got the cool room, and then there was the shitty one down in the in the bottom, and yeah. So yeah, it was a great. I mean, it was a great time back then. Um, I, I love Detroit. There, <laughs> it was, <laughs> you know, it was just a, a totally different time, but. Uh, you know, it was a lot of fun. But, yeah, now, shit. I don't know. What what is it like out on the West Coast? There's still lots of places. I mean, we to... there's some, you know, like everything, you know, in L.A., everything has moved from the Sunset Strip pretty much to downtown. You know, there's, like, venues downtown now, like the Terragram Ballroom. And, uh, you know, I can't even think if there's another one that everybody always plays at. But, like... <clears throat> I mean, the Viper Room, the Whiskey, and the Roxy are still open, but other than that, you know, the didn't ha- I the... didn't I just read though that the Viper Room might be sold? Yeah, they. I think they're gonna. The what I heard last was they're gonna take that whole block and make it mostly into another hotel, but then keep the Viper Room in the lobby as the bar in the lobby of this new hotel. It's... So it's sort of like putting CBGBs inside the airport, LaGuardia. It, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So we'll see. But um, but yeah, Whiskey, Roxy, Rainbow seem okay because they're all in the same ownership family right. anyway. I have to show you. Speaking of of rock and roll over, this is my proudest accomplishment in a band was being able to have our our own blacklight poster of cool. that. Cool. So, oh, that's really cool. I'll send I them like to, that. I'll, I'll send them to you guys. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. That was actually for a Viper Room show poster that we did, and then then we loved it, the art so much. We were gonna like, you know what? We'll we'll risk the cease and desist order to print up these black lights. Oh, posters. totally, <laughs> absolutely. Because and actually, I think Kiss gets a kick out of that kind of thing. Think so? Oh, yeah. yeah I was I was just gonna say there. You know, un- unless you're like printing up hundred thousand of them and trying to sell them in spencers Mm -hmm. uh, they don't care i mean for the most part if it's what you did for for a show poster they're quite honored by that sort of stuff i mean frankly gene will be like hey can you send me six copies of it for my collection you used to wear the jeans addiction shirt you know yeah those guys sold that i mean it's it's not like you took two hundred thousand dollars from kiss fans uh for a book that doesn't exist (laughs) If you wait each episode, there's always, there's always, a, there's always something, isn't there? A uh, jab at Gene? No, no. That, that's a jab at somebody who's an author that's, I don't know, five years, six years behind in releasing his book. Which book? No, 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 we're done. We, we don't want to promote okay. this guy anymore. Okay, okay. 
Um, we'll share that with you later. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, Jim, I would love to. I mean, since you're 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 an active recording musician, touring. Mm-hmm. What's what's your thoughts about what everything is going on in the music world right now? That you know, not only are shows done this spring, they're questioning whether they're going to happen at all this year, and maybe they'll start summer of next year. And major labels and bigger labels are delaying album releases because there's no touring. Amazon isn't shipping new release material. What's your take on all of this? I think, you know, I've always been a person that has believed that the more somebody is forced to change, the better off everyone else will be. Because now, you know, I basically lived, you know, personally lived through the entire collapse of the music business because, you know, right when our band was getting, you know, was getting, you know, having getting some substantial popularity, you know, in the early 2000s. That's like when the whole fucking That's when Napster came killed out. it. Yeah. Same thing happened to Flip. Who's that one? Flip. They did. Um, they released two or three records in the U.S. and they had a couple of chart singles and they played Woodstock and then everything went. Right yeah, then it all just it all collapsed. But my point is, is that you know, out of that you know, happening at that time, you know, a lot changed because it had to change. That's what streaming came from, right? Like, not that, you know, and not that I'm the hugest fan of streaming services, but because, you know, because music was forced to change the way that it's distributed to people and because it kind of evened the playing field as far as, like, being able to put out a release, you know, like, all of a sudden the Internet gave us this distribution you know, mechanism that had never it existed before. Right. You know, like the four of us could put a record together right now and it could come out in the same space that like the new, you know, whoever record comes out in. That's that's a very big change. And I think right now it's gonna it's like an accelerated version of that time because everybody's gotta figure out how to do this differently because the world has changed yet again. Like, you know, I just I think that the I think the days of giant arena shows are going to be that's going to take a while. Like I think that's going to take a good long while to get back in the swing of things which will hurt the big big artists, you know like yeah. that's the but, artists that are that's where they're making all their money. But wouldn't you agree though that larger bands whether it be Foo Fighters or Kiss or the Rolling Stones or U2 they can hold a tour off for a year or so and it really is not going to change all that much I think it's better I think yeah they'll they'll be actually even more of a fever for it but it's the smaller bands that rely on the meet and greets and the Uh uh tickets and or the merch sales that are really going to get hit hard I do agree, but I also think that I, I can see it as an opportunity because just like in the film business right now, you know, I had seven days left to shoot on a a, a tier one horror feature that I was working on. We we got shut down seven days before <laughs> fucking <laughs> we had seven shoot days left. But anyway, um, I I see it as you know all these giant juggernaut companies that have only been pumping out the same shit for so much like Disney and you know just pumping out the same the same story and the same content over and over again with a different skin on it that's not something that we can sustain anymore like we can't sustain a movie with a crew that's you know 200 people cuz right. 200 people can't be in the same place anymore at you know the, in that close proximity and now all the rules and, and regulations are going to come in and I think that that we can't tell anything until that happens. So like, do you think it's possible that people that love films like I do will get an opportunity to see more movies I actually like? Because I could care less about any of that uh, Marvel stuff or any of that. I like the Pope of Greenwich Village. I like those kinds of films which are smaller. I think that, the, the, in my opinion, I think that the formula that, that will happen is movies like you're talking about, like story-driven movies, right? Yeah. 
they're cheaper to make and you can make more of them at a time. Right. And now since the distribution, you know, the streaming distribution mo model is a lot like that, that model, sorry, supports movies like that way better than it supports like a new star Wars movie. Cause yeah. people don't, people don't want to go watch a new star Wars movie on their TV. It's not exciting. Yeah, they but, want to go to the theater, which I totally understand. And I get why they make the, the movies they do. It just feels like for the last four or five years, when I'm looking at different choices, it's I'm very sidelined because so much of it is action hero type things. And it's like, which is fine. But I, I miss those 70s movies like Three Days of the Condor and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Stories, stories. Yes. That's what I like. I mean, that's what we, you know, we watch too. But I mean, like, if you look at, like if you look at Netflix, you know what Netflix is doing, and even you know what Amazon is doing with movies like uh, Peanut yeah. Butter Falcon and stuff. Like those movies, you know those movies still exist in script form all around town. It's just you know there hasn't been a market for it because, like, I don't know the people are only gonna watch what you you know like what you promote. Just like you're saying with the FM yeah. radio thing before. When, yeah. um, when Mark and you, and you were talking about that, like the FM radio thing, if if it's still to this day, if you have a song on the radio in heavy rotation, it will be successful. And it's the yeah. same as it's the same as a movie. If you spend Thank a shit you. ton of money on marketing that movie, chances are it's going to be successful. But yeah, there's not going to be. I mean, I've been on you know giant giant movies, and there's 200 people on those crews, and you know, it takes like four people to hang a fucking light on a set, you know, and they're not six feet away from each other when they're hanging that light. They're like sitting on each other's faces. You know, it's like they're on a ladder and on a scaffold and stuff. And it's like, that's, what's going to be interesting to see is what, you know, if, if this situation that we're in can actually shift tastes away from, you know, having to be those big budget giant things and get people back to basics. Well, and I almost wonder if Netflix and Amazon are also helping drive that because look at the fascination people have with the Tiger King, mm -hmm. you know, that it's downright stupid, but it's brilliant. You know, was that, was that out or was, is that a new, cause I did watch it and I thought it was great, but it, how long has that been out? Hasn't. I mean, I'm telling you, it came out like the day this shit started. Yeah. So, I mean, it wasn't pre obviously because no one knew this was going to happen. So that that came out at just a, a regular time and just the craziness of it, you know, was it's the lightning the bottle. Even okay. though you could go back and you could watch on YouTube all of the clips yeah. they took pieces from, uh -huh. you could watch the whole story. But m most people didn't know about it. I literally didn't even hear about it or even know that existed till whatever, two, three weeks ago. Neither did I. And I'm like, I, I watched it half-heartedly one night and I'm like, this is awesome. I, I, yeah. I, I was I'm with you. This isn't, this isn't fake. That's, I had listened to two podcasts about it before it came out. So I was like super amped to see all the things in real life. Especially like the places, like that office where the kid shot himself and stuff, because you don't oh. see that on the podcast. Right. Not that I was looking forward to it, but you know what I'm saying. Like totally, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It was like a weird. <clears throat> so that's the only reason I knew about it. But you know, it's like Animal Crossing on Nintendo right now. You know, I have an eight-year-old kid, and that came out like the day this all happened, and it just seemed like it was a perfect thing for an eight-year-old kid, this, like, global game where you can all visit each other's islands that you're making at the same yeah. time. It's, like, the perfect game for a quarantine. It's like a ro it's like roller, toaster, roller coaster tycoon. Yeah, exactly. Except for that, like, it, ha it came out on the day a quarantine started. So clearly yeah. the marketing potential was amazing. Lightning. You know, I don't even, I have, here's, uh, that is, woo! Right. I, you, couldn't you know, you, I couldn't tell you one thing. I, I am, what I... I'm excited to see that's changed in the movie industry is real movie feature movies going straight to digital rental, not to the free streaming, but you know, yeah. the, the example being trolls too. Yeah. It's like buying a ticket, but you can all watch, you it. watch you it at home, you know, and, and 
you know, I'm not buying a ticket and taking my daughter to a movie theater because I'm rolling the dice that it's a 50-50 chance that she's going to sit through the whole thing and see it all and, oh, we're leaving after 10 minutes. Well, no, God damn it, I just spent $30 on popcorn pop and tickets and everything. Now I can rent the movie. And I, I think, and you might know this, Trolls 2 had the highest single-day digital rentals yeah by far blowing away any other movie because now people are sitting at home going yeah i'll spend 19.99 to rent this movie for two days and that might hopefully change the movie industry going all right we don't have to do the old school release to a movie theater then then you know wait six months and or three months and then finally release it for consumers it's like go straight to the consumer well, and now, I mean, honestly, like, you know, te- technology-wise, we have, I mean, I know this is going to sound fucking terrible, but we have the ability to do some pretty amazing live, you know, like, live presentations of, of, of things that we never had, sorry, before. I mean, not like gimmicky shit like 3D, but like, you know... If you had a live performance where you were really controlling the sound and you actually did it in an environment that was, you know, had spatial relations, you know, like surround sound or, or Atmos or any of these things, like you could make a concert experience for people's houses. I mean, we, it's not going to be the same thing. I'm not saying it's the same thing. But if people put their minds together, you know, about how to present that to other people. It would be awesome. And to be perfectly honest, right before I was on this the podcast, I was telling you guys that that um I was watching this clutch, the band Clutch was doing a broadcast from their rehearsal room. It was just them playing songs from their rehearsal room. And seeing a band like that is that's what the band is. Like when I was watching that just now, I was like, This is what this band when they get in the room and they do the thing. That's what it is. This is the first time you're ever seeing that from this band. And how cool would that be to see with all bands? Like, well, okay, we, we, we're all... we, we talked about this, I think it was last week. Did you, Jim, did you see the couple of video clips that Paul Stanley's recently released? Mm-hmm. Those were, are, are, you know, five minutes, Hours. eight minutes. They, 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 mm-hmm. they, they, they were phenomenal. Those that are the, ty- the t- types of yeah. things that if they had done that back in 1978, our heads would have literally yeah. exploded like, oh, my God, it is so cool. It's amazing cool that somebody at the level of Paul Stanley or, you know, Brian May has done some amazing stuff um, jamming virtually with his fans. You know, John Bon Jovi did the thing where he recorded part of a song and then asked his fans to finish recording the songs with yourself. This is incredibly cool stuff bands and are inspiring. doing inspiring and yeah. inspiring and, and and makes people pick up instruments you know that's why i do all those projects with dave is like everything that we've done up until this point is that we're trying to inspire a kid to pick up an instrument and change the world you know like that's what that's that was the only thing that got probably most of us through you know our our entire youth and, and, and our adulthood is like you know, being so connected to, to an art form, like more than any, you know, like we're all very connected to this thing and we love it so much. It's like, that's what inspires all of us to do the other things in life that we do. You know, it's like, yeah, you know, you should, we should always be, I mean, not to sound like a fucking old hippie or anything, but you know, like to me, it's like, we should be inspiring each other all the time, you know, like, yeah, you know, Everybody should, in a perfect world, we all encourage each other and we all do something that's inspiring. And, you know, like Kiss has always done that, just as an example. And a lot of bands, you know, like all this music that we love, these guys were trying to inspire us. These men and women were trying to inspire. And that's what I think we have this rare opportunity right now to show people that they can be, you know, they could be super creative and and be inspired, you know, regardless of what the hell's going on in the 1100 to well, in smaller square feet that we all live in that we're trying to not go insane. And in. yeah, and I also too I've noticed that one of the beautiful things that come, that's come out of this lockdown or 
emergency, whatever you want to call it, is it's made people or forced people to stop and think. Mm-hmm. And that's how you create. I've, I've spent a lot of time walking here as of late for a myriad of reasons. And it's really clearing my head out. And it's giving me some things to think about. Whereas other days they would just pass by. And I would be going from one thing to the next and doing work or being at home and, and taking care of stuff there, whatever it is, not taking the time to actually contemplate, okay, what's my next move with with my real estate stuff or my photography? What can I do? And, and I don't know, I think that that's a blessing. And I think it's going to create more opportunity for people to be creative. At least that's what I'm seeing when I'm looking at people on Facebook. No, I agree. I, you know, again, like, you know, we're all very, like, we're lucky to be in the time. And if I was younger, I'd be, su- I'd feel super lucky because every tool that I ever wish I had is available now, you know, basically in this you know, like this is the this yeah. the ever all the tools are right here. Like I can it's make a crazy. movie with this. I could, yeah, I can record songs with this. I could distribute it to the world <laughs> all in my hand. Like that that to me is more powerful than than anything I was ever given as a kid. So you just hope that people get inspired and just go fuck it. I'm gonna make a movie. I'm gonna tell my story. You know, I'm gonna. I'm going to sing my song or I'm going to paint my painting. I don't know. That's what's cool. When I was a kid, I had rocks and sticks. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, We we were out eating mud when we were kids. Yeah. Um, Jim, you know, as a musician, what's your take on meet and greets moving forward? Is that going to be a concern to bands? I don't think that's happening. I mean, honestly, I just, you know... Again, big bands, there's a lot of liability there. And nobody, I mean, I can't see anybody wanting to take that on any, anymore. But I don't, I'm not sure. I mean, you know, I would, we would do a meet and greet with the fan, but I'm not shaking anybody's hand or hugging anybody anymore. You know what I mean? It's like weird. But, but, but even just standing shoulder to shoulder for a photo. Yeah. That, 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 that could, that could do it. Yeah. Not a guideline. Yeah. No, I don't, I don't think it's going to, I mean, like, I think everything is going to have to change, and I think that the people who didn't want to change before are going to be forced to. You know, like all the big bands are, like you said, wondering. I mean, Live Nation canceled every show till next year. That's like, isn't like Live Nation the only company left that promotes well, I, music anymore? Li- li- Live Nation and AEG, I think, are the only. Well, yeah, like, is, have they officially canceled everything? I ev- thought so. Every every tour, I. I let, let's be clear. I don't know if it's all been canceled or postponed because that's the big argument right now. When a yeah. show is postponed, they don't have to refund your money. When right. a show is canceled, they do. And if you noticed, was it yesterday, Bon Jovi yeah. canceled his 2020 tour mm-hmm. so he could make sure the money was refunded to his fans. Otherwise, if he just postponed it until 2021... You don't get your money back. He's he's you know that guy's all right. You know I gotta say, you know, he seems yeah, all right. I had about a grand into Stones tickets and it's postponed and I can't get my money. Yeah, back. you won't you won't until they actually cancel it. Now now they they, have, I, I shouldn't say that. You know they I think they're also looking at changing policies about stuff like this. But you know I you know having done the VIP ticketing programs and fan clubs for for artists in the past listen nobody wants to cough up that ticket money because that's a huge float that somebody is sitting on right now of millions Mm -hmm. of dollars that's earning interest and you don't want to pay that money back no you know it's it yeah it's going to be very interesting to see how all of this changes i i i yeah i i'm with you i question whether meet and greets are going to happen at any level. Well, and, you know, especially for the bands that we all like, they're all old, you know, older people. So it's like, you know, you're super susceptible. A lot, a lot of pre-existing conditions with bands that I like, you know, due to great years of amazing behavior. I mean, myself yeah. included. So it's like, you know. And, if and, you're... And, and those bigger bands, you know, let's be honest, they, they 
don't need to sell the meet and greet to survive. It's no. good money by all means. It's very good mm-hmm. money, but they don't need to do it at the risk of no. anybody's Life. health. But smaller bands that play to a couple hundred, 500, 1,000 people, That's huge. you know, those 10 meet and greets that night, you know, can be a big difference between where you're staying and the food you're mm-hmm. eating and and all that other stuff. That puts those bands in a bind of do you risk your health to do this uh, what do you guys I, I, yeah how would you say that your concert attendance all, all three of you guys like would you say it's on par has it gone down every year like att- attendance you still go the same as you did yeah, my, my, yeah. My, I, I, I will say mine you know I've got a six year old so what you know I think we can all understand that once you've got a new kid all of your personal activities completely disappear go go away go down until the kid can either stay home by themselves or you're fortunate enough that you've got a family member that basically lives across the street that can take the kid every night in my case we don't have family in california so it's a babysitter well you know nobody's getting babysitters now no. There's, there's, you know, for me, yeah, my concert attendance has, for the last six years, has been, you know, maybe one show a year because it's just a challenge to schedule it all. Yeah, they don't usually stay up. Like, my, we, my kid's eight, and when she was seven, we took her to Def Leppard and Kiss because she wanted to yeah. go. And she saw, she saw that, and we made it, like... I think there were like two, like the, we made one encore at uh, in the Kiss set because yeah. that night it was Def Leppard and then Kiss, and we made it like through one encore, which was great. But yeah, it's it's hard to get them to go. I go by myself, you know. If I see, if I want to go see a show, I just go without, and you know, obviously my crew. But um, it is it's a thing where I just concert attendance has gone down, so this hopefully won't be like the final nail in the coffin kind of thing that's what i'm hoping yeah and i i photograph bands so i shoot probably 200 shows a year that's awesome and that's including festivals you know and so that's replaced someone coming over to my house with a new record saying hey check this band out that's how i'm finding my music is going to these festivals and discovering bands i've never heard of before have you guys ever gone to the uh, Psycho Fest? Have you been to that? No. Is that Out the in one Vegas? in Vegas? I've heard of it. Never been to it. Very. That's a super bummer because it was Merciful Fate this year. Like the only U.S. Merciful Fate show. So many. Like this is like one of those yeah, weird I just saw years. Them. It's just last year. There was I so saw many. them. I saw them open for Motorhead. In 1984, what tour was that? Because I am not. I, 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 this is a big matter of fact with Ralph. Oh, you don't, you, but these guys know. I, him and I have so many common bands that we love. I just can't get into fucking that guy's voice. It, it, it is nails on a chalkboard. Love the music. I love, get it. Love the music. But I saw, I saw Merciful Fate. That had been in one of their very first tours because yes. it was the, uh, Again, it was it was I saw them with put it this way, Exciter was on the um uh uh what fucking the second record. Um God of, I keep ex- of Exciter? Yes. The uh the one with pounding metal on it. Pounding <laughs> metal. <laughs> Violence and Force Tour. I saw Exciter was the open band. It was Exciter on the Violence and Force. Um, and then it was Merciful Fate, and then Motorhead was touring on the No Remorse package. That was a fucking incredible night of metal. That was, uh, yeah. but I just couldn't get into fucking Merciful Fate, man. Just that guy's, the whole King Diamond thing. Just, I just don't get it. Yeah, I, I, I can see it. It's, it's an acquired taste. <laughs> <laughs> um, Did you? The uh, the SOD thing, the King at the King, that's fucking hilarious. I love yes, <laughs> I, I just I was just listening to that record, the SOD album, the other night because I was trying to explain to somebody what it was, you know, because like for somebody who wasn't there when that happened, 
it's so hard to explain. Like, well, it's all these bands members together doing this other thing pretty much as a joke, but then it got really popular. So then they had to kind of do it seriously. Mm. Jim, Jim, before we, we wrap up, because we're, we're pushing, God, we're probably two hours, two hours here. Um, I got uh, you're 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 worthy of the question. Uh oh. Not every guest gets this. Tell so me. So your question. Did Vinnie Vincent save Kiss? God, he's thinking about it. Actually thinking. <laughs> I think. Yeah, I do actually. I think oh, he. Re- I think, think we're re- wrapping up. I think he <laughs> resuscitated Kiss. I think he was what could that what brought him into the you know brought him into the next. Whether you love the phase or not, he brought them into the next you know the phase that made them. He kept them relevant in the fans' minds enough so that they could do a '96 reunion. Like that's basically what it boils down to. Your opinion isn't the issue here. It's that Mark is going to do a victory lap now Oh, because he believes the same nonsense. So nonsense. (laughs) See, see, Jim, Jim, the 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 reality, and Mark will will not admit this is the reality, is the only thing that saved Kiss was taking the makeup off. It's what built it up so that they could put it back on. It's like a mm-hmm. comeback story. Everybody, the comeback story is a classic. You know, it's a classic part of of our culture and and what and something that we love. It's like they, you need it. You need it, especially if something's around that long. You know, it needs to. It needs to have a comeback. It's take, you know, every- take lick it up off the record, and they're done. They don't even continue. They break up. It's true. But right. you know, but my counter to that is you you leave that record exactly as it is, lick it up, but Kiss keeps the makeup on for lick it up, they're done. They're going nowhere. That's 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 true as well, but I I would I, it's, say that that's true as well, but at the same time, all things being equal in in a serious rare serious moment. They needed he he wrote eight of the 10 songs on that record. And look, let's be honest too. And, 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 you know, I I think at times Gene and Paul basically put their names on those records. Oh yeah. Or those, 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 those songwriting credits. Uh, You could just tell by the, the structures of the songs and, and whatever. They were mostly Vinnie compositions. Um, and that song, and that record in general, is looked upon as a as a as a high point in the band, and and also too, I will say it once until I'm blue in the face. At that point, and Michael's correct, people did start taking it more seriously. But I don't think they would have had the success without that. And I'm talking about specific song. "Lick It Up" is a good, catchy song it was the song they needed at the time much like they thought you know like nevison was gonna you know put them into aerosmith you know trajectory but that didn't happen lick it up the song put put them to the point where radio would play them without snickering yeah but 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 you know i i've i've said this i i think and you know this is just based on that story i share about calling the radio station lick it up got attention because all of a sudden the makeup was taken off because you know the, I'll, I'll i'll tell you jim you know growing up in minneapolis creatures of the night phenomenal album mm-hmm. i love it loud i mean it's just heavy 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 mm-hmm. radio didn't touch that didn't no. didn't even blink an eye at creatures of the night lick it up it- comes out and kq which is the major rock station in minneapolis is all of a sudden playing Lick It Up. And I call the DJ going, playing stupid, like, oh, my God, who is that? That's That Lick It Up song is amazing. And he's like, I kid you not, he's like, that's Kiss. They took their makeup off. I'm like, 
you know, doing that over the phone, like the makeup had nothing to do with it. You know, yeah. Creatures of the Night had even better and heavier songs on it. Yeah, and so, they had plenty so of makeup on. I, I think, I think, yes, it is a great song. There's no denying that. It's everything is great about the song, but because they took the makeup off, all of a sudden, the music industry listened with their ears and not with their eyes. Yeah. Well, you know, going through, um, you know, I, I said earlier in the episode, I've been going through my my clips and my boxes and, and I'm working on, yeah, as you guys know, I'm, I'm working on a kiss project and, and that's Tommy's, he's Tommy's asleep. At the Tommy, window. wake up, man. Well, I just, I feel like you've had enough abuse today. So oh, please, this is, this is Mark. There. So, so anyways, um, going through those, there's a, I could not believe the stack of, pictures and it's funny they've got the names wrong on some of them it's so you know great. what i mean of, of the as a matter of fact it's it, it's it fortunately did a good job here it's always a creatures era picture next to a lick it up era picture and um you know uh all those articles it's also too to, fun fun to remember that you know it was it poly who, who, who was where was it poly in in japan vic i don't think it was still victor at the time but they may lick it up with a fucking, you know. They put a makeup, makeup insert, wrapper, yeah. You know, just just in just in case, <laughs> you know, um, people didn't didn't uh, you know uh, get into the to the non makeup thing. But you know, so again, weird. that being around at that time, because they took their makeup off, all of a sudden, all media was excited about Kiss. Yeah, well, it was, it was, was yeah, two it was years old or so three years cool old. to be a Kiss fan because now I am reading about Kiss in all the magazines, and you know they're on TV and they're here and they're there. It's just like, all right. Sadly, you had to take the makeup off to do this, but it was great because now all of a sudden it felt like yeah, you're getting the the recognition you were due for the last ten plus years. Mm -hmm. It's just. I don't know. It's it's weird how people hold on, just, hold oh. on. How timely? Oh, oh, this, oh Jesus! <laughs> you know Leslie <Lizzie> Presley? <laughs> Somebody pay Izzy to stop playing. He's taking. He's taking. Do you know Izzy Presley? No. Who is okay. he? Oh, we got to hook you up with him. I want him to start singing again. He doesn't know I'm doing this. Uh, second person lick it up starts. <laughs> Come on, dummy. Uh, <laughs> all right. I'm having a brain fart. <laughs> <laughs> Who is he? Look at all the people that left already. This is awesome. <laughs> I can't remember anyway. It's just... he's, he's, do you ever watch Seinfeld? Yeah. <laughs> okay. He's like the Kramer painting. It's disturbing, yet you can't look away. Right. He lives in L.A. He's a friend of ours, and uh, he's an aspiring musician, comedian, writer, actor. Well, let's face it. He's a Lyft driver. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, right now, he's not even a Lyft driver. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and he he'll he'll actually like if you pay me, I'll stop playing these songs. And he just has this way of, I don't know. I I will I will definitely connect you with Izzy because he's got he's got a yeah. podcast in L.A. called Another Effin Podcast. Uh -huh. Um, and he's really you know he's also tied into the scene. He knows everybody. You would have I guarantee you will have a blast talking to him. He's a great guy. We just we just give him a hard time because he eats pasta at Seven Eleven and he cl you know, he, cl he, cl he claims Seven Eleven pasta is the best Italian food he's had. What is wrong with him? <laughs> That's, what That's the question of the day. You know, a lot of people ask that question. I don't even know what that. I don't even know what Seven Eleven pasta is because you're sane. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> you probably go to an actual authentic Italian restaurant 
Not to Seven Eleven. But what do they have? Like what spaghetti in a pot for you to take yeah, out? Yeah, they like they. From what we could, what we've seen, they literally have like a heated linguine in like a carry-out container. <laughs> it's like it's less than ramen noodles on a thing with a plastic film, and you put in the microwave. I gotta see. I gotta yeah. go. Yeah. You when need you, all... so, so you know what? When 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 I connect you with them, tell them you want to go have dinner with him at Seven Eleven. And see what he says. Yeah. And then he'll tell you, "Go fuck yourself." That's the best part. He'll, he'll go. He'll go. Did Branville tell you to say that? <laughs> uh, it's I love um, that keeps giving. Jim, um, before we go here, let's tell everybody what what's Fireball Ministry up to. What are you up to? Plug, promote, well, websites. The, the old the old people in our band are trying to figure out right now how to do some kind of a live or at least what looks live performances online while we're sitting around here. And then, you know, it's like, we, we've been talking about writing stuff and, you know, again, it's nice because it gives us just like this kind of like need to kind of look at what we want to do next. Right. Like how we're going to continue as a band and how we're going to, you know, give stuff to people because it's going to have to be something new. Uh, on the on my other in my other life, we're we're finishing up a new actually a new Dave Grohl documentary about uh, you know he's been talking about it a little bit so I feel like I can too. It's like uh, a movie about following your dream and you know getting in a tour van and why it's important to go on tour and, and you know basically it's important to just say fuck it and throw everything out the window and go do the thing that your heart tells you to do kind of documentary. And we're going to hopefully have that finished up soon. So, you know, I mean, I'm always out there making or doing something. So, and I have all those, you know, I have all the, the whiz bangs. Fireball Jim is my Instagram. And, you know, our band has all the stuff. Fireball Ministries, Instagram and all that. So I'm always doing a lot of different things. You know, I like well, staying so, busy. So people get out and support it. Go and, go and check yeah. them out. Yeah, if you know who Dave Grohl is, uh, uh, and and you like to watch things on a screen, I'll, I'll usually I'll usually have something to do with that. So you're gonna Excellent. you'll probably run into it by accident. That's awesome. It's awesome, cool. Jim. This was this was great. I, I I was I was when when you when you were out um, going to the bathroom, I was telling these guys, I'm like, this is actually an intelligent conversation. <laughs> well, yeah, we're not used to that. It. It's an intelligent kiss conversation. Although we do, we usually do pretty good when we have guests. It's when we're just the three of us or four of us when Lisa's on. That's where things kind of go bad. Well, I got to tell you, my favorite part is when you clearly touch upon a subject that you guys are either all in agreement on or some of you aren't. And trying to figure that out is was my favorite part of the whole time. <laughs> Uh, like the Excellent. Vinnie, Vin the, the polarizing Vinnie Vincent stuff is my favorite. Oh, the, oh. I, I, we we love those types of discussions because I mean, to the concept of the show, three sides of the coin, we we're fine if all three of us have drastically different opinions because we're completely respectful of it. I mean, I, I I'm the guy that you know I'll go to my deathbed like Crazy Nights is one of the best Kiss albums ever recorded and you know these guys won't agree i don't care it doesn't bother me i'm not gonna i'm not attacking somebody for a different taste mark's not attacking somebody who doesn't agree about vinnie vincent you know it that that's the cool thing is we try really hard to be respectful of each of our opinions because at the let's be honest at the end of the day music is nothing but one personal opinion yeah, no, no right or no wrong. Like we always say, that's why we want the people who listen to this show to feel free to always make comments in any one of our news feeds on Facebook. And we protect them so that they will not get harassed. There's great debate going on, but everyone treats people, each other with respect. Cool. I like it. So yeah. that just means that if you ever come see our band play and I'm holding the pink and silver <laughs> Vinnie Vincent model Jackson that you will respect <laughs> Yes. Yes. Emily from our band will have already stabbed me like through the in the ear and you'll I'll just be playing like my eight last notes ever cuz she would really not be pumped. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, yeah. As the man said, love kills. 
Uh, anyway. <laughs> Uh, this was awesome you guys I loved jim, it. jim yeah this was a this you're you're welcome back anytime you want to talk kiss promote something love it you just let us know this was a great conversation yeah you're always Thank welcome you, yeah. always welcome uh you know guys as i said that was such an incredible smart fun well thought out. well thought out conversation i mean jim was just amazing i mean from knowing the stuff because he's in the industry and he's working with these people. But I mean, clearly he's just a huge kiss fan. Well, and what a nice guy. He's, yeah. he's one of us. Yeah, exactly. Know? Well, he's not, he's not so much a, a Weisenheimer yet. Well, we'll get him there. <laughs> and we got to get him on Izzy's show. Yes. Oh, I, I got <laughs> <laughs> oh lord yeah uh, that'll be something um all right so homework questions uh, you know have you seen it have you I, oh god i hope you've seen some of the 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 documentaries and movies that jim has oh, done with. sound city you gotta yeah, check it yeah. out it's amazing sonic highways i mean it's great yep. stuff um have you seen that stuff have you uh, seen fireball ministry do you have any of their albums you know just Talk about Jim and all the stuff he's done. Yeah. And anything else that's on your mind? Anything that just fits in with what we talked about. Yeah. You know where to go. Facebook.com slash three sides of the coin. YouTube, uh, Spreaker, Instagram, Twitter. We're everywhere on the Internet. God knows you. you got nothing else to do. We're all stuck at home. So watch mm -hmm. more of our shows. Watch more, yeah. more, more, more. Um. And, of course, if you are watching on YouTube, hit that little red subscribe button, please. Follow us on Spotify or leave us a review and rating on iTunes. It means a lot to us. And uh, i got to confirm real quick. Hold on. Do, do, do. Let me check my calendar. Um, next week. I, I shouldn't do this because it will jinx it. But fingers are crossed. It has been confirmed next week, Dennis DeYoung on three sides of the coin. For me, that's a freaking cool moment. Yep. That's fanboy moment. Dennis <laughs> DeYoung. And there's KISS connections there. If you don't know, go do a little sticks, KISS research, and you'll quickly find what the connection in, is. In, in my boxes, I have the proof because yeah. they opened for KISS. In '77, and I have uh, I have a big review of the show and uh, all that stuff. Matter of fact, I think I think the show that's very famous show, the Houston show from '77. Yep. I think Styx was the opener in that night. Oh, okay, interesting. Yeah. Well, we're if 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 nothing changes next week, we're going to have all these questions for Dennis. Of course, we'll talk about Styx and we'll talk about Dennis's upcoming solo album which by the way i just heard sounds great sounds really cool um all right so that's it three sides of the coin we're out of here see everybody next week Love the show. Go to iTunes.3SidesOfTheCoin.com and leave your review and rating of Three Sides of the Coin. Thanks. Download your free, free copy of the KISS School of Marketing. 11 Lessons I Learned Working with KISS. The number one downloaded business book on Noise Trade. Go to books.noisetrade.com slash Michael Brandvold. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. So you love the show. Go to iTunes.3SidesOfTheCoin.com and leave your review and rating of Three Sides of the Coin. Thanks.